Golly. Start the damn stream we before I piss myself. Are alive. No <laughs> thanks to Alex. We are alive. Out. It's not my fault that my son made my mic not work. Okay. But he's your son. So it's your fault. And it's you your mic. It. <laughs> what do you think Magor would do? Um, <clears throat> kill somebody? <laughs> yeah. Done. Fire and blood. <laughs> Fire and blood for sure. Well, welcome, welcome. Thanks for like not ditching us um, five minutes in when we. Even though Leanna unprofessionally held up the stream. Oh, oh, really? Or did I very courteously wait until all parties were ready? We need all hands on deck for this beast. <laughs> well, we are here to talk about the quick little, basically novella that is Fire and Blood. <laughs> George R. R. Martin. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to start this chat. I, do y'all need to introduce yourselves? No. Yes. I don't know. What do we do, Jimmy? You're in charge. Uh, I mean, I think at this point we all know the the war band here. I, th I think uh, you know okay. this is it. You know <laughs> who we need to introduce is not ourselves, but the like 50 billion characters that are in this <laughs> book. Let me just like go to the family tree and Leanna, just start fine, naming names. They're all dead. They, they're, they've they're been dead for fake. hundreds of years Spoilers. they're all fake part two's not out yet dude uh yeah but listen yeah, can we just like maybe jimmy would you like to dramatically read for us this character list ah yes uh <laughs> no nah, i i uh it's written so fancy i pronounce half of them and wrong. you should start at the bottom and read it you know like aemon targaryen son of viserius targaryen daughter of <laughs> and let's just go go up no. I mean, I really appreciate the fact that Gurm said, uh, you know, the rule of not naming your characters with the same first letter. He said, <laughs> no. or even like basically, it's like the same name, and then there's like the the end of the name has like one letter different, or like kind of love it. Different. <laughs> like all of the Reinas, Rainies, Rain, <laughs> like, Rainis. Rainira, I'm sorry. Yeah. Which one is this? No Kyles, no <laughs> Kyles. Kyle. Unfortunately, there is a Kermit. There is, there is a Kermit. A <laughs> there is a Benton. That's right. Um, from Bear Island. I mean, let's be honest though. George's names for the Targaryens are sick. Like I wish they're I could great come up with names. names. They're just hard to keep track of. They they are. Yeah. And then when they're names that you do recognize from like present, you know that they're like not the same character but the same name. Then you're like, it feels good to recognize it, but also worse because you're like, but I have to like also that's not the same person. I mean, yeah. at least when we get some of the like <laughs> like i would actually rather they have the same name and have a first and second after it as opposed to reina rainies right now you're like I actually can we get that. some like numerals on there so we can keep track of this yeah i kept getting rainies and rainira mixed up as i read through even though i already knew the story of it i was like still getting it confused and then george that son of a gun made an aegon yeah, and then did. an aegon <laughs> And then it was like, okay. Yeah, I did. Aegon the Younger, Aegon the Elder. Okay, fine. But I kept getting them mixed up. Like, wait, which son is this? You know, he's just such a bastard. And there were two Viserys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. In addition to the Viserys we already know oh, yeah, from now. the yeah. main series. <laughs> I love Yeah, there is Elmo as well. I, is Elmo in this, or is he in the World of Ice? I think he's in the World of Ice and Fire. I don't remember uh, Elmo in this. I, I don't remember Elmo in this, but I was, the there were so many series. names that I was like, it very possibly was, and I missed it. <laughs> the main series still has the best name. The tops all the names, though. Yellow Nimble Dick. Dick. Oh, oh, yeah. No. Dick. Trust Alex to bring us <laughs> What? Like that. I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so were you guys surprised that it is uh, legitimately just a history book? <laughs> yes. I was at I first, was. but then obviously, you know, I, I mean, not all of it feels like that. Like some of the Jahara stuff, you know, yeah. feels like it's because you're following so much of him that it feels more like a narrative. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there is straight up just like, here's the things that happened. Reader, yeah. <laughs> learn your history. Oh, okay. What did every? I mean, this is your second time, Jimmy. Third time. So I've read everything other than um, the egg on the third stuff, but I never read it like page to page to page. I'd read it in like like okay, I'm gonna go read about the dance of drag. So I went back and read. Oh, that, I thought right? she would so, just like shuffled the pages and read it totally out of order. And I was like, what are you were confused? Do you imagine? <laughs> uh, but this is the first time from cover to cover, and the first time reading egg on the third's piece, uh, which admittedly I feel like I retained the least amount of. Um, for whatever reason, I think it's because I was exhausted out of after the dying of the dragons. And I was kind of telling you this before, Leanna, but I I almost feel like for this book, you mean when Alex was just like off having a nap? Yeah, whatever he was doing. What's he, happening? 
whenever you went to visit the Citadel. He's having a nap you... right now. <laughs> what? You, were, you were gone, so we were chatting before the stream started. Oh, you're talking about like literally five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. My mic didn't work. Okay. Um, but I was saying it. how I kind of wish I could have broke it up. Um, like after the dying of the dragons, I needed like a breather because I love that section so much. Yeah. And then Aegon the third just seems a little less cool. Um, but if I'd had like a yeah. week or two, I think I would have been right back in it because I, when I finished Fire and Blood, I'll be honest, I was kind of like, ah, oh. like I'm kind of sad. And it did end abruptly, kind of like what you said, Leanna, earlier. Yeah, but you started a Game of Thrones again. I thought about it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I did say that off, uh, off or before we went live, and like, yeah, this book. If I have a complaint, it's that it ends so abruptly. Like, yes. not even just that, like, oh, I thought we'd get more story, but it did, like, wrap up. No, it literally feels like it's, like, mid-chapter, like, mid-whatever. I was like, where's the, where's the next page? What? 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 Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, it, it was like he sent it to his editor, and they're like, George, stop. And he was like, okay. Like, that's kind of what it felt like. It It's always hard to tell these type of things, but did you guys get the feeling that George was just having a blast writing this shit? Oh, yeah. It's probably, like, the dopest shit for him ever. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> It's like, I know everyone wants me to continue this series. I think I'm just going to write literal history of the Targaryens. And it's it sounds like <laughs> real history, too. Like, I think well, that's um, the thing that always impresses me. I was going to say, like, what did you what did everyone rate it? Oh, come on. Four. I, I didn't give it five. You know, it's a five for me. Come on. I I'm gave biased. it five. <laughs> I gave it four just because it wasn't like for me, it just wasn't as cool as it is. I feel like it just it wasn't enough of like. It didn't interest me quite enough to be like, oh, my God, I love this. Like, I want to read this again. That's I was right. just like, yeah, well, so it's really cool. And like some of it's awesome, but it's also just like it's Targaryen history. So it just, well, like, so like, okay, it just I like, has to knock it down a little bit for me. I gave it five. And I thought, you know, that part of it is um, while probably the part that puts people off the most is also the part that is the most impressive. Um, and like when I went to go rate it, I kind of assumed um, without having ever like paid attention to what the rating, the aggregate is. Um, I was like, well, probably only like diehard fans are picking this up. So that'll skew the rating pretty high, you know, cause yeah. like it's mainly diehards and the rating was like super low. Mm -hmm. So then I like kind of quickly scrolled to see like, okay, so like, what are these Look reviews saying? Way. And like <laughs> the reviews, <laughs> the reviews that are like, this is just Give me um, wins bastard. No, no. I mean, more. that's the whole thing is obviously stupid. No, but the ones that are like, this is obviously a lazy cash grab. I'm like, do you understand no. how much work went lazy. into this? Fuck, like this is like takes are is arguably harder to do than the main series. Like, are get out of here? Like, do not even. Maybe you think a it's dry and boring, but do not even. Targaryen history that takes place hundreds of years before the main series was lazy. No, I mean Rebels that's just... Creed is a la lazy cash grab. Fire and blood fucking go. is not okay. Ah! There's there's a difference. Yeah, but so like basically that's so like if you like Doctor to Star because you didn't find it as engaging, like you know that's valid, like sure. But for someone who's like <laughs> this is this is lazy, like no la lazy makes no sense. Me? Like, you can't write a book this fucking long that's literal. Like you're creating history of your own fantasy world. It, like the amount not, of like micro plots he had to come up with yeah. is like you know usually an author comes up with a plot and then you can tell that plot for 500 pages here there's enough <laughs> plots for like about yeah. 700 different books if you oh, took yeah. any yeah. one part of this and make nope. a novel don't out give of it him ideas. Come up with all of those plot lines <laughs> and just don't like, give him any ideas i mean yeah i first off i mean <laughs> i literally almost had a commit i was dead <laughs> that was the greatest thing i've ever heard uh <laughs> but the fact that some of these things that we actually read were hinted at during the main series that he wrote 20 years ago, and he was able to fit it into, I mean, a pretty cohesive history. I'm not going to say narr it is a narrative in theory, right? But it's not a traditional narrative. Uh, but he made it fit in the history and didn't make it just all about those moments. He like built around them. And like, I don't know about you guys, but like at some points I was like legitimately not able to like just stop. Like I was like, oh, I kind of want to find out what happens after this. Um, especially after the conquest, because it felt like such an end of an era. Um, I was very, very impressed with how interesting I found it, but also like how easy it was to read. 
Um, but also just like, okay, so I already said it's hard to like come up with all these plot lines. So like, don't say it's easy for that. But in addition to coming up with every single plot line, he also came up with like five alternate plot lines for many of the plot lines because conflicting <laughs> sources say it might've been this and it might've been this. Mm-hmm. So it, it like, and then the fact that like including that so you had to come up with like a splintering of plot lines in the first place yeah. and two that you're including that and that makes it feel more like a history like mm-hmm. that you've paid attention to that detail instead of just like telling a history because like a true history that of anything we have nowadays there's gaps there's holes there's things true. that like our best guess is this or like we truly do not know and we will never know it always was, depends I mean, on who's writing the history too right yes i mean the victors tend to write the history and that's i don't know i just you, and you also have to take like, everything with a grain of salt. Which is also, also like the narrator mind. of this book also is like, so this source says thus and such, mm-hmm. but they probably would have tended to view favorably of anything to do with the faith. Whereas this source says this, but they tended to just write anything salacious. So neither is to be really relied upon. Between the two, we can probably find some truth. And it's like stuff like that. I'm just like nerding out. Like that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I felt like a big ass nerd reading this book. No it's, doubt about it. It's really lazy. <laughs> Um, did you guys like mushroom because I saw um, uh, like Jake Bishop was reading this and some other people and I, I don't know I don't think this is what Jake said but I remember somebody I think it was in your discord Alex they, they were saying how like mushroom really wasn't their bad like they didn't really enjoy mushroom whereas I love mushroom well, I mean what immature... is it that they don't like about mushroom that I'll be honest so I, can't, I can't really I remember to go, like find the, the Good conversation luck. It was a while back, but I, and I've actually seen this from other people as well, but they feel like it's just kind of nonsense. Like, you know, not to trust mushroom. Whereas I feel like you're actually supposed to kind of read between the lines with mushroom. Well, and it's just sometimes... like, again, like that's what I just said, like basically the two sources for the, a lot of it that he's got that like those two sources consistently are where he's, this author is pulling from are one is like from the faith and mm-hmm. one is mushroom. And he's basically been up front the whole time where like, they're both skewed in like, one is a puritanical version of things and one is like an incredibly lewd version of things. Neither is gonna be very reliable. They're both extremes. So we're like, we're trying to navigate a path to figure out like where and when, who was actually present, who like, what they might've been alluding to, when we have a third source that can corroborate one or the other that like, they're equally unreliable. Yeah. And for me, Mushroom added some humor. I mean, you know, this is a textbook essentially, right? So like whenever you have that little bit of humor, I think that that's what kind of carried me in through the second half. Um, Literally. But also, okay. Does anyone remember the old like video from when the internet was young? That was like badger, 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 mushroom, mushroom. It's a snake. (laughs) So like, I just wanted to say mushroom, mushroom. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I love Mushroom. I thought he was great. Um, I like when uh, authors play with narr- narrators. Um, Erickson yeah. does it a good amount. George actually does it uh, in the main series with Sansa and the Hound and did he kiss her, did he not, and all that kind of fun stuff. So I thought it was like really on the nose, but it works because it's a history book. So I loved it. Yeah, I don't know who. I don't know when this conversation would have happened. Oh, bro, it was like a month ago. It was a while back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, had I was to- trying to search for Mushroom, but it's probably like spoiler like barred so i'm not actually gonna find yeah. it apparently. yeah yeah i think it was whatever um but yeah i i have i happen to enjoy mushroom i thought that it was funny uh it hit my sense of humor especially some of the things that he uh well i up. i did partially at times think that like so we talked about in the main series about the times when george gets a little like into the voyeuristic exactly and so then like even though, so like the narrator of this book is like, and then we have this extremely lewd thing that is definitely not what happened, but I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> so you're like, cause like George, wa- he is a mushroom. He wanted to write the salacious version, but then like, he like has the like plausible deniability, like cover of like, and then this thing that like clearly didn't happen because that's too extra. But let me tell you every detail about what like, <laughs> that happened, because like, I've just told you that it's no way it's this, but like, let me tell you what it is. <laughs> Yeah, he's getting the tabloid information and posting it in the middle of a uh, a textbook, yeah. essentially. <laughs> um, I, you know what I kind of would have liked is for like th- there's definitely times when the narrator is like, okay, like we can probably believe Mushroom, like he said it a little bit dramatically, but like more or less he's telling us the truth about this. But for the stuff that was like way out there, like yeah. that's clearly not it. If those had just been footnotes, if he had been like, and Mushroom had like a wild story about this, like, and then mm-hmm. just like keep telling it, but there is a. But no, that's like, okay, so this is what Mushroom said about it. And it was it was not it. <laughs> I love that there is so like there's people that can recognize that it's literally a history book, and that's like functionally like why it doesn't work for them. 
mm-hmm. because they just don't want to read a history book. So like I'm kind of in that camp. And then you have somebody like this that goes, anyone else feel like this was the outline for the future HBO show? No character development, no yeah, dialogue. It just felt like a laundry list of things that happened. You know, like, that's like, what a, like history a history book. book. <laughs> yeah, like, come on, guys. I Now, uh, mm. I will say, I think this makes me way more excited for House of the Dragon. I mean, I was already excited, and we got to see what happens. But... <laughs> I was like, Jimmy, don't try to make it sound like you weren't excited for House <laughs> well, of the Dragon. <laughs> I'm just saying that story that they're trying to tell. With the but Dance also, of now that I've read Ooh. this, um, and I have context beyond they're playing a Targaryen, who does Matt mm-hmm. Smith play? Uh, I believe he's Damon. I believe. Let me look. Yeah. I don't know. I'll, f- I'll find I'm out. I'm wondering if like if House of the Dragon does really well though, are they just gonna like green like a bunch more seasons of it and just start picking oh, through this book? But not that like this they like could. art would be anything to go off of. Yeah, but, it's like, Damon. It's Damon, by the way. I mean, not again, like not that the art would be indicative of like who is playing who, but honestly, the the drawing that looked the most like Matt Smith was Aegon the Third. Hmm. Don't you think? I could see that. I, I do think Matt Smith has a bit of an antagonist look on him, at least with the, the wig on and the, the Targaryen look. So Damon being such a dastardly dude. Yeah. Like it's good. I'm, I can't wait to watch Matt Smith in the show. I like Matt Smith a lot. I've Guys, only actually seen quick, him in the crown. Patrick said that this book is better than a feast for crows and dance of dragons. Big disagree. <laughs> uh, but like, doesn't this look like Matt Smith? Factually incorrect. Yeah. Who is Matt Smith? Matt Smith is Doctor Who or the guy from The Crown, uh, Prince Who. I mean, oh. he's so in Morbius, lol. <laughs> All right, let's I heard it's really good. Uh, Matt Smith was in The Crown. That's how I know him, and I thought he was fantastic in The Crown. He looks like he's evil. He's very regal. He has a very regal look about him. He looks like he should be a villain. Yeah, slightly uh, slightly inbred, like all Targaryens, which is always a good <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's so rude. Well, he has that kind of like lack of eyebrows, which goes with being having like pale blonde eyebrows. He looks evil. Dude, I, I yeah, I think he's going to be a great Damon Targaryen. Um, I mean, he's a good actor, so I would be like anybody he's going to play, he's going to do a good job. Even yeah. in Morbius, a lot of people were like, okay, like, you know, this book is or this movie is terrible and this role is terrible, but Matt Smith is giving everything he can give to like make something out of this role. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think uh, everybody that's been cast so far looks pretty awesome. Um, did you guys notice how many times Valeria, like the Doom, is mentioned in this book? And we actually oh, and like were you? Was it you, Jimmy, that said that this book becomes horror at one point? And like, yes, it surely did. Yeah, princess, and that uh, part was like illustrated. <laughs> princess <laughs> like... Aria or Aria, sorry, uh, Princess Aria. Aria. Is it? Uh, I was, I was like, I. We whenever I, li- whenever you listen to the audiobook, it sounds like he's saying Aria. And I was just like, oh, well, also there was yeah. a part. So like, I did the immersion <laughs> reading thing of like reading along while listening, mm-hmm. and I've never done that with a book, and I couldn't ever do that, but I had to with this. Same. And like, there's the part where there's like Eric fighting Eric, and ones with an E and ones with an A, and like, I was like, yeah, if I wasn't looking at this right now, if I was just listening to this, I'd be like, Eric's killing himself. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's some internal imagery for him and his. Uh... <laughs> no, it's just straight up two Eric's because George is just a jerk uh, like i wish the narrator because the narrator doesn't say Arik and eric which would be helpful if you're not looking yeah. at the text time advance was like i'm not getting paid enough for this nope uh yeah but uh princess uh i already forgot area uh yeah. we'll call her area like just area um wow what a scene though she comes back on uh balerion right and has been to Valyria and has things crawling out from underneath her skin. Like Wait, that was so wild. Sure, do they say for sure that she's been to Valyria or they just suspect that that's where Valerian would have taken her? They, they believe that it, that it went to Valyria because that's where, right, but like they don't, but they don't know that because she never says that's where they went. No, wait, does she? I believe she actually ends up telling someone, I thought. Or am I wrong? I think she just says, I never, and then, like, collapses. And then, like, it's a maester <laughs> that's, like, everyone was wondering where she would have taken Valerian. But the question we didn't ask, and we should have asked, was because she couldn't Balerian. control it, where would he take her? And, like, where would he go, probably? Home. So, like, their, like, best guess is, like, based on how she came back all messed up, and that it would have been the dragon probably in control of where they went, that it's probably that. But like, it's not just right. like the ending of the show. He took her body. To I don't care. Oh, it's exactly like that. Yeah. Now I, now I kind of want to know what happens. <laughs> <Now> you <know>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I thought it was like one of the craziest piece of 
the whole series. In With fact. stuff and, like that, they're like, okay, this is a dry history book, but there's so many moments like that where I'm like, and the fact that it's a history text that is like, and I, we don't know what happened, so we can't tell you. And you're just like, oh, that's so interesting, but what happened though? <laughs> yeah, I, I want to see what happened. And like, uh, Balerion like, has weird. wounds. Yeah. So what? But like we were talking about him? in um, like in Aegon's, I think it's in the first. I don't remember the first chapter of Aegon. Where we're we're talking about Aegon first, and he gets the letter. And you're oh. just like, oh, you're never going to read this letter. And I'm just like, what? No. Can I have the letter, please? <laughs> well, we need the letter. What is in this letter that I mean, says, Dorne is now so at peace with us for Basically, I want Lin-Manuel Miranda to do a musical version like Hamilton is history with, you know, rap. But this is Targaryen history with rap. Oh, and then we're going to have a, a room where it happened, the room where it happened. But it's the letter. <laughs> it's the letter that no one ever saw. We don't know what the letter said. <laughs> yeah, it was Daria. Who was the I believe the princess of Dorne at the time? Also, Dorne is just the best. Dorne like, is metal as fuck, dude. It's I know, I know. We got Iron Island fans in the house. You know, I know, Leanna, you love the Iron stuff. Islands, but you got to give it up to our sand people down there. And in, in, oh, uh, Dorne's Dorne. awesome. Holy cow! Dorne, Dorne is unfortunately no tainted by the depiction of Dorne in the show. Eh, no, they're not. That's just fake. That that was all a dream. But no, I mean, just because the fact that you have. The Targaryens march up to the north and the Starks bend the knee. Like the north bends the knee and then they go to Dorne. And they're just like, where is everybody? Why is no one here? What's happening? And they just like, they start like starving and dying of like disease in the desert and they get ambushed and die more. They just keep coming back. Like we are seriously going to take you out. And they're like, yeah, okay. Just yeah. Good luck. Keep Welcome coming. to Dorne. <laughs> I mean, they're poisoning people, the assassination attempts, all this stuff. And it makes Dorne in the main series just so much cooler for me. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to harp on season eight or anything, but I will say this. The this is what make this is honestly, I know everyone has their beef. This is the beef I have with the last episode is the fact that Dorne sits at the council and lets the Stark say, Well, we were independent before the conquest. It's like mm -hmm. bitch, Dorne was independent for after the conquest. Like, get out of here. Like, if anyone should be the seventh kingdom leaving, it would be Dorne. Which this book was out when that sh when that came out, so that pisses me off quite a bit. I mean, they um, obviously didn't read this. So. No, they didn't. Um, it is interesting that that's my biggest gripe because I know what, people have like way bigger gripes, but that's like the one that really like bothered me. Um, what yellow do you think toad. Of this theory? Uh, I think the letter said Dorn had Rainies. She survives the fall, and that she was in love and doesn't want Aegon to attack anymore, or she kills herself. So I do think Rainies was probably alive, and it's likely that her crown is the one that we're going to see Young Griff get crowned with. I think that Oberyn Martell, or I'm sorry, Dorn Martell. I don't uh, remember a Griff in this book. <laughs> but yeah, you do that though. Won't you at some point have to tell the readers in? one of the next two books that she's actually alive or was alive. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll happen. I, I mean, that would be epic, right? And it also is just a huge symbol uh, dating back to like the original conquest and the fact that Rainey's was kind of like her own person, even though she's yeah. involved with a I mean, her dragon was dead though, right? Yeah. Like that's confirmed. Yeah. Her, her dragon was dead. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But also, so <clears throat> there's there's a lot of times in Fire and Blood when there's a malformed demonic childbirth. There's more than one. Yeah, what's up mm -hmm. with that? Like we're not talking about just like like really slight defects and like an inbred. Yeah. No, we're kid. talking like talons and like yeah. yeah. But then you wonder is that true or are they just saying that to talk about how But I also works. wonder cuz like with Danny, you know, there was the obvious one to one of like, well this mm -hmm. witch lady said there's a price that's the price like we're mm -hmm. like that's gross and weird but like it, I, i'm guessing that you know you're like i can see why that happened but here it wasn't always i think there was one where there was like a witch lady like nearby and you're like probably her fault but there was plenty of times when there wasn't and you're like is this supposed to be like basically like a fantasy version of like an incest baby that's like see all this incest is giving you demon children or yeah. is it supposed to be a more like witchy thing where like they are somehow being cursed by something or like what is that <laughs> well so, i don't know what do you want to i mean or is it their blood of the dragon <clears throat> and sometimes those recessive dragon genes pop up and they have like half dragon children that are like <laughs> that's kind of what i think and this after this book came out a theory came out that mary uh maz Ghoul didn't do anything mm -hmm. to danny and She's that danny just had a miscarriage because if you actually remember before this she gets knocked down right so like the chances of that baby again nuts. Yeah, so I, down. Yeah. <laughs> I 
there's a chance that there is no curse on Danny and that she could get pregnant later, right? Like, so, well, I mean, if there's a curse on Danny, it's the same one that's plagued her family for a generation. Generations. It's not Mary Mag uh, Magzul. I always say her name wrong. Um, but like, but she wouldn't have any way of knowing any part of her history other than when Viserys right. told her. And he obviously didn't say some of our ancestors yeah. had demon children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, uh, and, you know, she hasn't been around the, the Citadel. There's no maesters to tell her these things. As we know, the maesters are the ones recording the history. Um, so she's kind of in, in the dark. And the only thing she knows is from what Barristan's telling her and uh, Viserys told her before he uh, got the golden crown. So um, it's interesting. It adds a whole nother different light to that uh, that event that happens in book one. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even so, if you, you consider we have a literal Targaryen history book that is telling you that it's not even all correct or like a lot of it yeah. can be misinterpreted. So it's like absolutely when you have characters retelling history to each other in the main series, like they're right. probably all getting so many little details wrong. And just like over years and like generations, the story just probably is like totally incorrect for a lot of them. Right. Which is why just like if we're meant to like trying to figure out what's going on in this universe, mm -hmm. the same as our universe, the only way to figure that out is to put together as many different versions of the stories you can find and then see which of the things they agree with. Yeah. So like yeah. If, it, if it repeatedly, even wildly different versions get this one part of it the same, you're like, well, then that part is probably real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and, you know, uh, think about Rhaegar. The story about Rhaegar is that he kidnapped Lyanna and he assaulted her and all these things. And we're probably going to find out that that wasn't true. So. I, mean, I mean, we've kind of been told that that's already not true. Yeah. It just hasn't been proven in the books. It's yeah. also just that, like, there are characters that say that about Rhaegar, but for the most part, most of what you hear about Rhaegar all over the place, it makes you think of him in a very heroic and interesting mm -hmm. and enigmatic way. Yes. Like, yes, you hear some of, like, oh, well, you know, mainly from Robert, who's like, if he hadn't kidnapped her and been awful, but, like, most everybody, all the other accounts you hear of him and all of the history here about him, he just sounds like a very interesting and yeah. on the side of good person. Sounds like a Jaharis. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, for one, uh, do believe that that is the case, right? That that um, that he was not the terrible person that Robert Baratheon painted him to be and went to war and destroyed Westeros over. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. I mean, to be fair, before Robert happened, like they were already warring over shit all the yeah. time. Like, yes, there are so many mentions of just like these different, like all the families that we know and love just going to war with each other and vying for power. Yeah, this is not a peaceful land, huh? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not like at all. if you get 100 years, you're lucky. Like that's a good span. It's also um, pretty sick, though, that like the the actual iron chair was just him being like, I'm just going to collect all the swords from everyone that I slaughter that's and sick. I'm just going to build myself a throne. I am a little disappointed in the fact that in the show, it looks like a much more like reasonable, comfortable chair. Yeah. Sure. Whereas like it's not just from like images, like not just from drawings, but like the way they talk about the chair, like mm -hmm. easily cutting anybody that sits on it. Like the one in the show does not look like like I feel like you'd have to be drunk and like yeah. really yes. like ca like be extremely like careless with how you sit down to actually get cut by it. Um, in House of the Dragon, they're changing it so like it runs down the entire stairs, uh, full of swords, and it looks really cool. If you can see it in the uh, the teaser trailer, um, but Rhaenyra being on the Iron Throne and getting slashed and slashed and slashed and like you know it was almost like she couldn't stand it. Uh, you know, those are little things. The like imagery of that is just powerful. Well, yeah, I mean the the like you know, the uh, the the author of the book is mm -hmm. saying how like people were saying that the throne was like rejecting her. Yeah, and I think someone mentions that when Joffrey is on it, like, doesn't he get stuck or something in the leg, and he like cusses at the chair? Might even. Oh, when you say stuck, that. you mean like pierced? Yeah, like I just you yeah, meant no. like stuck. No, I was like, no. no, I don't remember him getting stuck. No, they didn't have to bust out the butter and Crisco, and uh, I got my head stuck in between two uh, fence posts one time, and they my mom had to put skull in my ears. I remember that. Anyway, basically the same thing. Yeah, same thing, really. <laughs> Uh, what did you guys think of the conquest? Because uh, this is the one I've been over so many times to the point where I was kind of like, okay, like let's get through it. But if I really think about it, it's pretty dope. Like when Aegon is says, uh, when the sun sets, your line shall end. And then he just burns. Her it's all. pretty metal. <laughs> it's so metal. I wanted to bring that up. Cause that was, he was like, what are you going to do? I'm in this keep. Like you literally can't touch me. He was just like, look at me. Can't touch like, this. Bet. <laughs> It wasn't just like, I'm just going to kill you. Like, you won't be alive to see tomorrow. It was just like, no. Like, your entire family 
will not exist anymore. Jeez. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh my God. And then like, you know, doing the thing that where he flies in the good. sun and he comes down. It's just that was like, so sweet. Like way up into the clouds insane. and comes straight. Yeah, oh my God. That was awesome. Yeah. Absolutely dope. Honestly. I think the conquest would make a great movie. Oh yeah, for sure. Give me that. It'd be like watching rain of fire with Christian Bale and uh, whoever else was in that. I mean, it'd be the exact same thing. Honestly, Matthew McConaughey would jump off the top of a (laughs) castle shirtless with an ax. I mean, I'd pay, I'd pay twenty or dollars. Uh, Now I want to see Matthew McConaughey as a Targaryen, but still with Uh, his own accent, being like, "All right, all right, all right," right," but you know, with like silver hair on the Iron Throne. (laughs) I'd pay for it. I'm not gonna lie. (laughs) He should play Viserys the first. I'm in. <laughs> I'm all the way in. <laughs> um, Magor the Cruel. Uh, I mean, one of the most nice lad. The one in next lad. <laughs> Just the uh, the coin flip of the Targaryens. I mean, he he is definitely the the bad side, right? Yeah. He's but a also, real, like you know, shit. there's a, I I like the way that the throughout the book, like you can kind of. I mean, some of it will be when it talks about what they're like as children or something, you know, like what their temperament is like. But a lot of it is like when you see how the parents are, you're like, this isn't going to go well. They're going to be mm-hmm. that's the parents are like um, foster, uh, sowing the seeds of like discord, like yeah. especially like with like before the Dance of Dragons, you're like the way like Viserys does not ignores this like Shakespearean drama that is brewing between like the two sides of his family. You're like. This cannot end well. Like, yes, they showed how the kids kind of didn't get along on their own, but like on their own, like, I don't think so. They hear what their parents say. Like they've been hearing nasty things from their parents about those kids. They didn't just like organically hate each other. That's right. And, and one of the things that happens after the dying of the dragons, I really liked is that Aegon the third is essentially depressed. And like that whole generation after the dying of the dragons is like trying to work through the trauma of like everything they've been through. And, and I, I don't know. I really like that because it could have just been as easy as Aegon the third and then give him some characteristic. But it like it actually impacted the generation following, which is very similar to like World War Two. Right. For a, a large portion of the world. Well, especially because like when all of this happened, he was a kid. Like, yeah. I mean, it would it would fuck you up if you were we saw those brothers but... and sisters dying and his mother understood. I mean, it's 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 some pretty heinous stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's also just like formative years when like you need parents to be shaping and guiding you, but they're too busy killing other members of your family. <laughs> and to, and you're sitting here listening to people talk about how we have to like, we have to kill and fight and this is what's right. And like, you're just, that's during your like developmental years. What's, yeah. What you're like, that's going to mess with you. Oh, certainly. And there, you know, and you're supposed to be this big, royal, passionate family. You know, you are the family, and then mm-hmm. you see how messed up it is. Um, Wait, also, can we talk about how George R. R. Martin low-key did a Cinderella retelling in <laughs> Fire and Blood? Give it to me. The ball where he will choose his bride, and every eligible maiden under 30 can come to the ball and oh. get her chance to, like, <laughs> present herself to the prince for the opportunity of being queen. It's That's... literally Cinderella. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I haven't read Cinderella in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely just sneaks in that kind of stuff, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Jahari's the first, though. What a Chad. Like, what an absolute <laughs> just unit, dude. I love he this. Had a lot of, the, the Targaryens have a lot of children. They sure do. Also, like, yeah. those chapters were like, uh, Al- Alice, Alice <clears throat> When yes. she's like so yeah. done with having kids, and he's like, "Nope, I think we're gonna have some more." And she's like, "Please, please, no uh, more." <laughs> well, th- those two together. Was that Jaharis or Aegon the Head Thirteen? Was that Jaharis? Or was that Jaharis? This Jaharis, I believe. Yeah, because um, like she oh, just kept man. popping him out. Goodness, because Jaharis and Alisane. Yeah, here's his family tree. <laughs> yeah, they, they like told us his first five kids kind <laughs> of like that. separately, and then all of a sudden she's like, and then she had like, a whole bunch more, and they just like yeah. named them all in one paragraph, and I'm like, "Are you, I hope you're gonna like." <laughs> like come Fleshed back to out. that and not yeah. expect me to just remember it off of this paragraph <laughs> well jaharis taking over and there was so much turmoil and then whenever he knights sir joffrey and makes him part of the king's guard after he was actually against him um what a, it was a good moment good moment of healing for the realm and jaharis is obviously the best king at this point uh, mm. since Aegon. um and then we get all of the supporting cast around because Alisane is amazing. I, and she is the one that got rid of the, the right of the first night, even though we don't yeah. people are still practicing it. They went up north and her dragon couldn't fly beyond the wall, which was a little interesting tidbit that I was like, well, why is that? 
Um, because otherwise the Night King would throw a spear at it and then haul God it out of the, the frozen ocean <laughs> and turn it into an ice dragon. Well, you know what she did? She just turned around and she went to Mole Town and mm-hmm. went and saw the Night's Watch prostitutes, which I also yep. thought was cool. And, you know, you can tell the Night's Watch is actually kind of regarded at this point. Like, it's not, you know, what it, what we know it to be from the yeah. series. And I thought because well, it's cool. not completely broken down and a joke yet. Yeah. And, it, and it, like you feel that like it actually felt different and mm-hmm. almost makes you like sad for the guys you know that are in the night's watch from the main series yeah. um i just love them touring westeros seeing the small people and jaharis being like you guys can uh damon can have his warring i just want to build roads like mm-hmm. i'm just making babies and making I will roads have roads <laughs> that's so dope but the king's road you know we hear about that and it's like We're oh, all just like throughout his it. life how every time something sad happens and it is like and then he did what he always does is gets back to infrastructure <laughs> gotta build some more shit <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness he did i mean it's like let's keep this guy sad because every time he gets sad we get infrastructure <laughs> he does he kind of puts the nose of the grindstone you know you work too hard you harry's uh, <laughs> well this about... is when you have the hamilton style song about writing like you're running out of time <laughs> he's building like he's running out of time <laughs> <clears throat> he was such an important part i mean he basically saved the targaryen family and probably westeros as a kingdom yeah, um, I mean they're they're mentioned multiple times in the main series too. Yeah, like and then it has the to be stories. his descendants that went and did a dance with dragons. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you have that many kids, like some of them are gonna be a little sus. Yeah, it just sur- it just fruit. surprised me that like they didn't establish clearer like un like inarguable succession rules when they had problems with this already quite yeah. early on. You're like, just come come together, have a council, and be like, from now on. These are the rules of succession, no matter yeah. what. Yeah, and they kind of, you know, he, uh, Jaharis end up setting a different kind of precedence, and then they just go against it pretty much immediately, uh, <laughs> which is frustrating. But I think the easiest time to revolt against a new rule is directly after it's done, because once it's solidified year after year after year, it becomes commonplace, and people kind of forget about it. People might still get angry about it, but, you know, it, it, that's prime time. That fresh, you know, implementation is, is when you can kind of revolt. Um what about Rogar Baratheon? My oh, pick yeah. for best character that isn't a Targaryen in the book. I love Rogar. That's because you love Baratheon. Yeah, right? Well, you're not wrong. And he does, <laughs> he does kind of feel like a little bit like Bobby B. But Rogar goes through. Well, so... it was interesting how like the these like uh, ancestors, they don't feel like, oh, this is exactly that. You know, like how TV shows will do like the parents generation, but the same actors are playing them with like different yeah. like, with a beard now. Um, so it didn't feel like that. It didn't feel like, oh, this is like Ned Stark, but 300 years ago. So he's got like a different beard. <laughs> like, it, I mean, they, but it like, even so, I was gonna say, but like, despite, so like, it didn't feel that the same, but it did feel where like, there's a kind of a way of thinking in this part of the world. And the Starks reflect a Stark kind of way of thinking. And mm-hmm. like, he seems like a very, like, he seems like he'd be real in the Stark family, like related to the, like, there's a sameness and same with like, a Baratheon, like not the same person, but like there is a something there that's like kind of familiar. Yeah. And, and you know, he's kind of described a lot like Robert, too. Like, you know, I mean, he's, he's supposed to be a big old Chad and big beard and muscular. And I think so the Warhammer like comes the after Targaryens, him. though. Yeah. And well, he ends up uh, marrying into <laughs> the family through a uh, um, Larian or what was it? That I'm was trying to name? remember her name. Was uh, it Valerian? No. It's not Princess Alison. It's it's Aegon's uh, mother. It's with a Valerian. J. Yeah. It's it? Alyssa Valerian. Yes, thank you. Oh. Yes, That's the do the du- du- Duager queen. Is that how you say that word? Duager, Duager. Oh. Um, which is the prince's mother, though. So yeah. he marries in, and it's interesting because he wouldn't declare for Aegon during Aegon and Magor's battle because he felt like Aegon wasn't battle tested. Uh, so he, he kind of goes in and out of being like loyal and then being a friend and then becoming an enemy again um, and not wanting to also, man, the Targaryens really love marrying each other, don't they? <laughs> we got to keep the bloodlines pure, Jimmy. We like to keep it in the family over here in Westeros. But I like how at first, like they, the, you know, the faith tries to like be like, well, we were okay with it with the originals, but like not no more. And then mm-hmm. you're like, well, and then 
quite quickly after that, like, fuck it. These guys are going to keep doing it. <laughs> make a doctrine of exceptionalism or something. Well, <laughs> make we, it mean, make sense. Yeah, we I mean, we see Rogar and, and Alyssa basically come to turn like come to blows over this. And this is like what casts Rogar out uh, for a little bit. Um so I mean, it's, it's just weird. it's just all about marrying your sister. Apparently, that's or that's uncle the jam. or cousin. Yeah, if sibling is not available. Yeah, <laughs> he was a good hand of the king, though. I thought definitely better than the hands that Aegon the Third got. I would say that's correct. Yeah, <laughs> Lannister hands seem to uh, to not do Holy. well. Yeah, <laughs> the Lannisters certainly don't have the Targaryens' best interests at heart. No. The Lannisters have the Lannisters best interest at heart. Yeah. I, if you go to Rogar's page, because I was like trying to remember every little detail, because I just know that I, I absolutely loved him. Mm -hmm. um, his page is so long. Like, it's insane how much Rogar did in this book. Because <laughs> he's so close with the Targaryens. Like, he was actually important. Yeah. And I mean, whenever he was waiting for Jaehaerys to come of age, I mean, he basically ruled the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Um it was sad whenever he ended up getting sent away. I, I want to read the Kingmaker thing, but this is like four paragraphs long, so we can't do that. But yeah, Rogar, super important, super dope. I would love to see Rogar on screen. I think he'd be good. And just get uh, the dude that played Robert to come back. <laughs> you have to slim do down. That. Yes. You have to slim down. No, just get the breastplate stretcher. It's fine. It'll be easy, okay? No, but I mean, I do think any um, adaptation of this previous era, it would be a mistake to cast anyone that was in the main series. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, nah. no, nah, not a chance. There's no yeah, way. Unless there is some like time, unless the timeline crosses over to where it would make sense to have them on this, like on screen at the same time, definitely don't cast them as a previous character because that would be dumb. Yeah. That'd be nonsense. Maybe like the little child that played Rickon, if he's an adult now, he can play someone. But because like no one will know. <laughs> I don't really care either, but because Rickon kind of sucks and he's irrelevant. But <laughs> rude. He's a what? child. That so? What was he supposed to do? I don't know. Zigzag. <laughs> yeah, and I forgot that uh Rogar and Alyssa had like that big falling out too. That was kind of sad, huh? Because remember, like, they never got better after that. And I think she ended up even having kids after that point. But they were, like, never on good terms again after that. That was kind of sad. It was, like, its own little tragedy. There's so many tragedies. Man. I mean, I was still, like, to those people who were, like, you know, it's just a list of stuff and, you know, like, nothing. Like, the amount of, like, emotions I had reading this throughout were, like, it's truly, like, for being so arm's length and, you mm -hmm. know, dry. Mm -hmm. Like, about when um, Alisane is losing all these children. Um, and no, we're not talking about like an infancy because she did lose, lose a few that way. Yeah. But like when she loses like all of her daughters, basically in pretty quick succession and like the yeah, I mean, there's just like so many times when I was like, this is this is truly sad. Or like um, after the dance um, with with of dragons after, after the dragons danced, um, <laughs> <laughs> they call it the um, dying of dragons, but it's actually referred yeah. to as the dance. Yeah, um, the when you know now that's Aegon's reign and we had um like the suicides which you know mm -hmm. or is it a suicide it's probably suicide like that's so sad yeah it is you know it's interesting that you say that about the distance thing so i just read uh, grace of kings by ken liu and i thought it was absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. but it, it does have a distance approach it's all it's almost like a history but like you're you're kind of there for it right um now the second book gets into much more of a personal narrative and i also think the back half of the book does as well but i i've seen a lot of people struggle with the distance thing and i get it but I think it's also like one of those things where everyone's been trained so much in third person limited that they have to know like, oh, they're sad because they told me they were sad. Right. Yeah. Instead of just looking at an event and like thinking about the moral, you know, impact it might have or just the emotional impact it might have on someone. And I know that that's not like not everyone's cup of tea and that's totally fine. But like, I don't well, know. I it's mean, strange it, to me that it most reminded that. me of like if you did pick up a history book about Alexander Hamilton and you read about when his son dies in a duel and it would be a dry ass history book, but I would be sad by it. like if I I read that and it's sadder because you know it's true. So if like a book like this does enough of a good job <laughs> of like 
being like a history book where it feels like I have to keep being like, yeah, but this, there are no dragons. But aren't there though? Like it feels so genuinely like a history book that the same frame of mind that I'm in, if I'm reading an actual history book where I'm like, that's so sad that that really happened. Um, yeah. So like reading this, like that's, I know it's not real. Like, yes, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> like some people who think the Game of Thrones is a history show, but like I'm in that frame of mind where like, this feels like a history. And you just told me in a very like, you know, not emotional way. And then, you know, this person died and like, that's what, and we move on from that. And we don't, and that, that coldness like makes it sadder to me. Cause it's just this, like, it's not like paragraphs and paragraphs of like, it was so sad and we cried so many tears. Yes. And it was, I mean like that at that point, I'm just like, yeah, I know it's sad. But here when we're just like, and then they died and move on. And I'm just like, Oh, that's yeah. So sad. You know what? I think it comes from a little bit is the fact that when we read, especially like, you know, we're in a community where like, everyone reads a shit ton for the most part. Mm -hmm. And even if you only read like three books a month, that's a shit ton. Like that's a ton of books, right? Way more than the average person. I mean, it's right. And I think that people just read to find out what happens sometimes, which is fine. I I do it all the time. I mean, it, it just is what it is. But whenever you do slow down and think about the implications and kind of like take a moment, I think that especially here with the history, I think that you can get a lot more out of books. And that's what I did with grace of Kings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it resonated with me so much. And I saw, I mean, a lot of people comment on my uh, review and they were just like, you know, I don't understand how you got emotional with this book. Cause I feel like I was a hundred feet away from these characters. And I'm like, I just thought of them as people. You know, I just, thought, I always think about that too. Like whenever like a uh, uh, fancy network hubs wants to know what you are drinking. Oh, this is the Cardoo good reserve. Uh, it's the fire and blood. I'm sorry. Are you the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland? I, I, I haven't seen it <laughs> probably. <laughs> If I am, I want royalties. Uh, it's the uh, yeah, it's the Targaryen Fire and Blood uh, one. It's awful. It's legitimately terrible. <laughs> I don't like it, but I'm gonna drink. Honestly, it. Honestly, this is pretty terrible. That's why Mix I still it have it. Yeah. I should have. I had a I had Grey Goose and Sprite, and it was delicious. Actually, it was very good. I mean, this one I know you're supposed to like freeze it, and it's like fucked up now, so it doesn't really work because like it <laughs> color changes. You know, when you freeze it, yeah. but the bottle like it's, I've had it for a while, so it doesn't really do it anymore. It's like, I know you're supposed to drink it cold, but like, honestly, you have to drink it cold because it's not very good. And like when it's cold, like you can't taste things as well. When yes, cold. I have the fire, the fire and blood one of those as well. And it's actually worse. Somehow well, I saw because um, when I was looking for um, hope, I mean, maybe the Stark one again, or like since you recommended the um, dude, just drink some nice watch one. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth. But like, it. I didn't know that Johnny Walker had done it because this is the White Walker. This was like the first one they did, and I didn't know that they had a Song of Ice and a Song of Fire. fire. Now, it's so cool then I looked at those it. and I looked at the reviews because I liked the bottle for the Fire one because like the Ice one, it has a wolf on it, not the Walker, but like it looks quite similar. So I was like, oh, I want to get the Fire one. But I looked at the reviews and the Ice one has or the Fire one has terrible reviews, and the Ice one, which is not this, um. But it is also this color bottle. It has good reviews. So I was like, hmm. maybe. Was the fire one like Fireball? It, it, no, they're all Johnny Walker. It just uh, tastes like blends. shit, to be honest. <laughs> it just isn't good. Like, I have all three. I don't even remember what the ice one tastes like. I just remember the White Walker one was like, eh, and the fire one was terrible. Which also surprised because like Black Label, I really enjoy. So I expected this to be on <sighs> par with. They were like, we can put the shit one in because we have the cool bottle and people are buying it for the bottle. Yeah, yeah these idiots will buy it. And I sure did. I, yeah, the bottle is cool. <laughs> I'll just like refill it with some black label. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. They should do a blue label because it's better. Blue label is very good. The Maester's reading a caution for young girls at candlelight under the sheets. I don't even remember. I was going to say, piece. I don't remember that. <laughs> Dude, so Miss Duncan the Tall like is easily the biggest a song of ice and fire fan i've ever met uh That's she because knows... you can't meet yourself well no 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 <laughs> she puts me to shame dude like i've never seen anyone know the text better i'm any of the youtubers i'd put her up against them she knows all of the... she knows this book in and out you know she i would read a section she's like oh what'd you think of this i'm like that happened and what i just read and she's like yeah i'm like shit missed it <laughs> <laughs> what this did not help Jar my memory. <laughs> That's what I'm all. saying. She just knows, <laughs> dude. She knows this stuff. She's a scholar. I told her she should start a blog because she had a really amazing write up about how women are represented in Fire and Blood. Well, I think she is a maester. <laughs> she is a maester. <laughs> but I told her she should start a blog because she, I mean, she did it in my Discord. I mean, it was like five paragraph, beautifully written. I was like, you should probably publish this somewhere. <laughs> like, this is really good because I do think the women in Fire and Blood are awesome. 
like Rhaenyra. I mean, some of them go through some awful stuff. But and like, that's, I mean, to be clear, that's yeah. because we're all sexist and misogynist. That's why we think well, clearly. That. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. That is correct. I found out if you, uh, nah, never mind. I'll tell you guys after. Never mind. It's a... Are you going to remember, Jimmy? No. I want to know. <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. Uh, our our friend man carrying thing put out a wonderful critique of the wheel of time show. Oh, I uh, wanted to watch that. I think it's a very well done, but people are now saying that he is, um, you know, racist or, or whatever. And oh, it's dear. like, I mean, they're dummies. Like any anyway, oh, so <laughs> dumb internet opinions. Yeah. They're just dummies. I'm just excited because like, I have previously expressed how many hours I'll spend binging. Holy shit. Content. It's an hour and 18 minutes. Dude. It's good. Bro. It's honestly but like, I it's was really excited because, like, I had hours and hours. I had, frankly, days and weeks worth of content <clears throat> for, like, Rise of Skywalker which and, like, for Fantastic Beasts. So I, when Wheel of Time was what it was, I was like, yes, there's going to be hours and hours of content that's going to be, like, taking this apart. But no, like, no, there aren't um, almost any videos that are talking about Wheel of Time. So I was like, oh, yes, an hour-long video talking about Wheel of Time being bad. I'm so excited. Yeah, somehow that show got really polarizing, like, even before it came out. And and you know what's nice about House of the Dragon is, is like I feel like it's just kind of a quiet rumbling leading up yeah. to the show. Like everyone knows it's coming. They're not doing a ton of press. Everyone knows it's coming. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's also because like it's an established IP that people true. have a fan base. Like they don't yeah. have to hype it because they're like, wait, build the Game of Thrones and they will come. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, especially like we know the score is going to be solid. We know the shots are going to be solid. The writing should be good. Um, like there, there's a lot of things that I think you don't have to worry about when it comes to HBO shows. And that's nice. Well, from a technical standpoint, because I mean, Wheel of Time had a lot of problems and <laughs> one of them was technical. Like it wasn't yes. all like, you know, it's just a gorgeous show. But COVID, no substance. I mean, yeah. But I mean, like it wasn't a situation oh, where they're I like, oh, it. they had like all the technical aspects, but then the We've writing was bad. Because like the end before, of yeah. the end of Game of Thrones was that way, where we're like, right, everything technically mm -hmm. is still beautiful, but the writing is bad. Whereas yeah. like, the Wheel of Time also had technical issues. Whereas with like you say, with HBO, and House of the Dragon, we can be certain that, like, at the worst, it'll be like season eight, where like it will be great in every way except the writing. Like, that's the only thing that could possibly go wrong because it's gonna have an amazing team to put everything yeah. else together. But yeah. to a general audience, big spectacle works. So, like, certainly, yeah. A lot of general audience probably enjoyed season seven and eight of Game of Thrones because they're just like, this is cool. And they did. Yeah. yeah, the general people I know that aren't us like in this. Yes, niche. well, general people yeah. have this at an aggregate of like just above three. So well, general people. I didn't say I agree with them. <laughs> I didn't say I agree with them. But those are the people that spend the money. I mean, those are yeah, the people who, sure. who, who who show up week in, week out and talk about it at work and all that thing, all those things. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty hyped. I think uh, seeing the dragons again gonna be pretty dope god the dragons are sick in this book too like i i just always dragons forget just, well cool. i like that they have personalities without being like straight up goofy animal companions that talk you know like they have just like you get like through subtext and through the way they mm -hmm. talk about the dragons you have a sense of them as like they're not just it's a dragon like there are yes. unique uh things about each one where they're like they're that's not just also that they're like oh they're, they're different colors like they have the way that you know your pets like they have personalities but hmm. they're not personalities in the way that like hmm. is a full-on human that's a talking dragon like it's that it i feels actually more like, like a, a very giant pet <laughs> yeah, yeah you put you put that in a wonderful way actually a pet because i don't know about you guys but like uh my my cat denver hates my mother i mean just hates her it, and it's actually rude like he's downright rude to her and uh <laughs> But you kind of get that a little bit from like Balerion. Like Balerion could not stand Viserys, you know. And and well, I enjoy kind of like again that. like the, the this attention to like these little details that just make the the world in the regular series feel real. And then in a history book like this, you have to do it in a different way. But you still have to have mm -hmm. these like random little like details of history that like this. Funnily enough, is this little quirk of history that like history books will have. Like and like um, I think that's a moment in Hamilton again where like. They talk they like some some lady named her dog after Hamilton or something. And they're like, that's true. <laughs> like, it's like with those weird like history facts that you just like throw out yeah. there. So like the the idea of one of the dragons being called cannibal because it eats the yes. other. I was like, I kind of love this. Yeah, yeah it was kind of dark, too. Right. Like the dying off of the dragons. Like I was like, no, <laughs> like you could see it happening. And oh, God, uh, what about the stolen dragon eggs? We get a little portion. of that. Do you think those three eggs are the ones Danny got? I mean, you can't help but be like, is it? I think yeah. so. I think it was. I think it's, it's just three. an Easter egg. 
It's yeah. It come on. An it's Easter nice. egg. <laughs> <laughs> and we just passed Easter. God, this is perfect. What a great stream. For that, I'll drink a little bit more. Oh God, I'm gonna. I so know you more. have other uh, songwriters and fire whiskeys, Jimmy. You do not need or to drink just anything. Before. Sometimes just you gotta stuff it. Or like drink put something it over that ice. doesn't make you squirm. Put it over ice. Stop it. It's good. <laughs> it's terrible. Mix Not it worth. with some Coca-Cola. <laughs> Might as well at this point. Um, Vincent said, I like that King Jaehaerys and Queen Allison's dragons were uh, seem connected since their original writers were married. Yeah, and I liked how some of the kids were like naturally good at riding dragons and some of them. And were, it was like, also interesting shit. the dragons reacting when they would die, uh, and mm -hmm. not because they died in front yeah. of them. Like they would know. Yeah. Kind of like the wolves, right? Like, there's definitely yeah. like a bit of uh, the bomb. wit in this yeah. world. <laughs> they are good friends. Mm -hmm. And here again, like, I feel cops. like it feels more authentic because um, I feel like there are other. I, I, I think I said recently, and I've said before that, like, in theory, the idea of a book having dragons, I'm like, ooh, dragons. But then, like, 99% of the time, I read a book that has dragons in it and I hate it. Like, not that like, I hate the book, but like, I don't enjoy well, how to dragons be fair. Are you made. hate every book you read. Exactly. Well, there's that. But I mean, George R. R. Martin writes dragons in a way that I very much enjoy. Like, I like how Have he you writes read dragons. a book from the POV of a dragon, though. Because you could do that. Maybe you'll love it. What? What? What <laughs> book is that? Oh, shit. I actually I don't think I ha do. I still have it. There is a book that I got at like a used bookstore. But, um. <laughs> It's like a multi POV, but I think it's written by like EE Knight or something. I don't know. I picked it up because it was like a dollar and I was like, this sounds interesting. But, but the dollar, characters are dragons. Flag. It's probably terrible. But, <laughs> but I mean, what I, I was I'd honestly give it a shot just because of that. <laughs> what I was going to say is that like, I feel like other books um, and, and other like fantasy stories will try to make a big thing of like, you're a chosen one because like you are a dragon rider and like the dragon has chosen you and you have this like special one in a million bond with the dragon and here like it's clear it's hereditary the like targaryens brought dragons targaryens feel connected to dragons but not all of them most of them and even the ones they do feel connected to like sometimes a dragon will take on another rider sometimes not it's like it's not really mystical like it feels like these are temperamental creatures that are like more intelligent than your average animal mm -hmm. but they are not on a human level of intelligence so like you do have relationships with them and they do bond with certain people better and they do like, and they like the Valerians, which is interesting because of, you know, Valeria, like, and like the fact that like in, uh, when rainy, uh, rain, rain, Rhaenyra, <laughs> Rhaenyra's <laughs> son awesome. is like, goes and grabs her dragon and he flies it and falls off of it. Ah. Like, but that too, that like that, that, that dragon is like, the fuck are you like you're not mm -hmm. my writer what is this and that then, moment like, got me too by the way i was like this guy's trying to help like yeah, it, that was another moment dragon. where i was like this is really sad <laughs> and then that the lady comes out what is she a bread maker or something she comes out and like holds him while he dies and he's like i'm sorry mom it's like fuck and it's, and it's even sadder all the times when the narrator of the book is like and then you know some bards tell it where like a maiden came and held him. That's probably just a bard's version to make it a happy ending. That probably didn't happen. And you're like, <laughs> but I wanted to think that it did. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that moment. That moment was pretty, uh, pretty tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. George uses dragons. My uh, so Robin Hobb actually has my favorite dragons per se. Um, but they are because, talking dragons, which is a lot more than when, yes, what George and has. a bunch of other stuff that happens with them, like later in the series. I think is really neat, but I think George leverages dragons the best. I think he uses them in his story. I mean, they're nuclear weapons, but also like a pet. They're also like you said, they're highly intelligent without mm -hmm. talking. Um, he gets a lot of money. They're like dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> dolphins, clearly. <laughs> Well, dolphins are like the second smartest creature on Earth, second to humans. I mean, I would assume they're going to pass us soon, to be honest. I think there's an episode of <laughs> Simpsons where they do take over the world. They and now, do. like, humans are subservient yeah. to dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> they're really violent about it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren is in the chat. Lauren is... Uh, um, uh, just finished Fire and Blood, like, a couple days ago. She, like, rushed yeah. to finish it for this chat, so that was cool of her. And uh, she enjoyed it a lot. I think this was her first ever read through of a song of ice and fire with us. Hell yeah! Isn't that cool? I mean, this was my first time through fire and blood. Me too. <laughs> and Night of the Seven Kingdoms, which I did. 
Oh. I did get a little dorky smile when we're talking about the first uh, Kingsguard. And they're like, and yeah, one was a hedge knight. And I was like, yeah, it was. Let's I go. I was like, I said Duncan. I know that <laughs> name. <laughs> oh, Dunk is so awesome. Dunk's great. So great. I'm so proud of her. Have you? Dunk I haven't seen who they cast. Do you know who they cast for? Yeah. So uh, Corliss Valerian. Let me uh, get the actor's name. I think he looks awesome. Um, who? Corliss Valerian, cast... the sea snake. Uh, who Did they cast up... the same guy that played Euron? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the one that uh, everyone that oh. thinks, you know, that everyone's woke if there's any actor that's not white. Um, so it is a black actor in his name. It's, is... Oh, so it's the guy in the trailer then. Yes, right. he yeah. looks dope. Yeah. Is it a familiar actor? Uh, I think it's semi uh, I think he's been on some BBC um, documentary or not or dramas rather. Uh, let's see. I mean, he's about to be in a documentary called Fire and Blood. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You right, Steve that name? Uh, Cousin. Yeah, thank yeah, you. That Hunter. sounds familiar. I watch a lot of British stuff. Yeah, he's I'm a British actor. He's a little older. He's been in a bunch of stuff. So Judge Dredd, Shooting Dogs, The Sands of Time, Prince of Persia, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, I think he looks really cool. And also the actress that's going to be playing Princess Rhaenyra, I think looks amazing. Like she's perfectly cast, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Emma Darcy. Is her name? She yeah, I mean, been in a I, bunch of stuff. For a lot of this, you just kind of look at it like a lot of fantasy takes place in very white places. Mm -hmm. And part of casting a TV show, it's just going to be inevitable that you don't cast only white people. <laughs> so yes. Like, there are some things where, like, the Last Kingdom is almost entirely white people until later in the show. Vikings is almost entirely white people until later in the show. But a lot of that kind of makes sense because it's more like historical of like these places in the year 800 probably didn't have a lot of <laughs> ethnic diversity. Or racial well, and that diversity. Too, I mean, yeah. like it, the, while you can take liberties depending on the style of the show, a mm -hmm. historical show that's trying to be somewhat historically accurate. Yeah is gonna hire you know people that look like the game of that part of the world but a fantasy yeah but there is no such thing as like accuracy so yeah well, i mean I anyone a lot of people would argue it for a song of ice and fire simply because it's supposed to be like based on certain locations of history and like historical context but it's like it's still it's fake like it, yeah. everyone will be okay yeah uh anyone taking it that serious is really really dumb or but but like a a critique in the other direction that kind of does make sense that a lot of people say about wheel of time <laughs> was like the two rivers. You have this tiny little like remote village out in the middle of nowhere. And it's like the most racially diverse place you've ever seen ever. It's like, that also doesn't make sense. Like it, it doesn't bother me, but I'm like, yeah, that doesn't. Well, Bobby J also wrote a uh, pale gingers that dwelt in the desert. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was broken from the start, bro. I, <laughs> Bobby J. But I mean, yeah, that's. Mind. I think when you're trying to like make something feel realistic, like there are plenty of like scenes or like locations in these fantasy stories that are more cosmopolitan places, mm -hmm. like King's Landing, where yeah. you have a lot of yeah. mixing of people. Whereas, like, if you had like the Starks of Winterfell all looking like very like multicultural, you'd be like mm -hmm. unlikely. But like the fact that King's Landing is very multicultural, very likely. The fact yeah. that the further south you go. Very likely. Any trading town, any trading post, mm -hmm. very multicultural. Very likely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And also the Valerians, like we, we don't know like they can be whatever. Like we didn't see them featured mm -hmm. in the main series because they're 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 gone. So yeah. like we can do whatever we want with them. They're gone because of racism. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's possibly true. Uh but Corliss Valerian is so interesting because he's the one doing so much of the voyaging in the series and like mapping out different places that they haven't been. But he's also part of whenever uh, Damon Targaryen, which will be played by Matt Smith, whenever they wage webs on uh, wage webs, wage war on the Stepstones because um, Damon wants his own kingdom. You and said just... wage webs. I really wanted like a Spider-Man crossover where they're like web slinging off of dragons. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm down again. I'd buy a ticket. But I thought that whole thing where Damon was trying to get his own kingdom down at the Stepstones and like just blowing them up with dragons, like basically just trying to colonialize, uh, colonialize uh, that area was pretty interesting. 
Doug Hall says the council passing of a Rainey's claim was doubly sad. Uh, first over her sex and second over her bump. Uh, the sea snake was the best hubs. He totally Mike dropped his way out of the council. Yeah. Yeah. Rainey's and uh, the sea snake are going to be awesome to see together. It's going to be cool. But yeah, screen. I mean, like that whole time, like not that I mean, they're both sides are kind of awful during the dying of the dragons, the greens and the but, blacks. Um, yeah, but like if there is like, I mean, it's hard to say anyone's in the right because they were conquerors in the first place. They made their own rules as they went. So you're like, how can you really claim to be like, this is right. But I mean, like if anyone is right, she, Rainey's has the claim. She was made the heir by her right. father. He never yeah. changed it. He had plenty of opportunity to change it. And like when this is all going down, you're like that seems like the side that it's kind of like Stannis. Like if anyone has a claim, it's Stannis. <laughs> like guys, like it's hard to root for the other side. Yeah. And Alice at Hightower is kind of sold to us as being this person that kind of weaseled her way in. Viserys was dying. And, um, you know, I, I love the whole greens and blacks thing, which I think is a callback. And Lena, you might know this better than me, but uh, Tudor history. Is that correct? I feel like, you know, history more than I do. I don't know that it's spe anything specific about greens and blacks, but I mean, like colors have always been, you know, used yeah, to by factions. Yeah, I thought be like, maybe it was even pre Tudor. There was something uh, with colors like yellow versus red or something. And I thought George was kind of paying homage to that with greens and the blacks. But I just thought that whole thing was was really neat. And Allison Hightower and Rainey's being at odds. Uh, that's like, I think, exactly where the show is going to pick up, because in the trailer, it seems like they're showing. um. Uh, they're showing uh, uh, Viserys dying is is what it appears to be. Uh, so I think that's like right where the show is going to kick off. And then you have um, uh, Kristen Cole, Sir Kristen Cole, the knight, which do you guys remember? Jamie was talking about the Kingmaker and he was talking about Kristen Cole all the way back. I think even in book two or three, uh, I thought that was really cool to see Kristen Cole because there's so much question about what role did he actually play? Was he really into Rainies, or was she trying to get with him uh and we kind of don't have any answers to be honest but i think the show well, is gonna have to answer it you just i mean this isn't to do specifically what you just said but like reading fire and blood like i would at no point recommend that someone start with that but at the same yeah. time like it makes me like want to have read it before reading the main series so like the only way because like the only way that this book makes sense is if you read the series but the only way that the like this like the not the only way but like then it makes you want um, to like you. The only way you get those references is if you've read Fire and Blood before reading the series. So you have to read the series, read Fire and Blood, and then reread re -read. the series. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of uh, what people say about the Cimmerillion too, and that's why they call this the Germerillion or whatever he called it. Um, also, it was written here and not Rainey's. Hunter corrected me, and he's correct. My bad. Um, yeah, that does add a bunch of context, though, doesn't it? It's pretty it does. neat pretty damn neat and I'll, and I'll be honest this is a weird connection to make but it does make me want to get to Cimmerillion and then like see how much is in there because like now that i know that i enjoy these types of books like i'm sure tolkien was excellent at it as well well like people i mean i always heard that the Cimmerillion was unreadable but then i've had a lot i mean a while ago i had people telling me no 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 you specifically there's going to be stuff in the Cimmerillion that you're going to really like so like i have a copy because i was like okay maybe yeah. i will and now yeah because like declaration of the rights of magicians that people talk about being like really dry and like it's too historical and i love the shit out of it and fire and blood love the shit out of it so i was like you know what silmarillion yeah that might be my cup of tea <laughs> i could see you liking uh grace of kings yeah i'm excited to read that yeah i think it's really good possibly my uh favorite book of the first quarter actually nice I mean, yeah. with how much hillary's hyped it i was like it's better be good yeah, yeah. No kingdoms of death yet though it's uh it's also a, just a really nice hardback which is a weird thing to say but saga press did it same people who did durfee's books and their quality is just outstanding i have yep. a paperback <laughs> i mean that's fine too i wish i would have done the paperback because let me tell you what the hardback a book too i ordered it a month and a half ago and it's lost so i'm pissed <laughs> very hard to get oh andy plies what's up buddy he's in the chat that's my best friend Silmarillion wasn't meant to be published what yeah well no he he really sat in the 70s right i got it back there i got the original american print of it. i mean there's a lot of tolkien stuff that's like come out since then that's like he had some notes on this publish it <laughs> windmill <laughs> slam that into walden books let's go just illustrate it put a beautiful cover on it yeah. new tolkien book <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do wonder uh alex you kind of said this earlier you said you wonder if they're just going to continue to go back to the well with this book and 
I'll be honest, part of me thinks that House of the Dragon could be episodic. And I think season one might cover the entire dying of the dragons, which would be really difficult because like, I mean, it's also a weird place to start, though, right? Because agreed. Like, yeah, I mean, it does going... feel like going back to like, less. it's like when a, an author has a really great book that's like their third book and mm -hmm. then you read it and then you go back to read their early works and it's not as good. So, well, it's that's like... what I, so I'm, I'm thinking that if it does well enough, HBO is going to be like, I like money. Let's do that again and pull Pitch another reading. story. But it would be weird if they start with like the dance or the dying of the like if they start there then It'd what are you to building towards like yes. are you gonna go back and do Aegon the first and like the original like conquering which like is cool but then it's decidedly like decidedly more boring after but you already the... did like the big epic like tv kind of thing of yeah like the dance so i don't know to be fair i do think That's that awesome. if this is an episode yeah hobbit's phenomenal um i actually like it more than the trilogy but not the That's a crazy person I am a crazy, but you're, you're right. Not I, I, the movies. No, not the movies. No one's kidding. No, stop it. <laughs> Except for the dwarves. The dwarves singing. I'm glad no. those movies happened to give us the dwarves. Jimmy's going to read Listen. so really and be like, this is going to actually be better than the no, there, no. Are there are people that think the no. really is better. Those than... people are crazy. <laughs> yeah, never. Never. Would you um, say Fire and Blood is better than the main series of A Song of Ice and Fire? Uh, no, but it is He's the like, one... I mean, maybe. This is not <laughs> Stop. If, if I'm being honest, I think it's the one I want to reread the most right now. Like, I it's think... probably the least that you you probably got the least out of it through one reread, and you've reread the main series so many times that you know it. Like, there's yes. a lot more to go through here that you haven't done before. Yes. I don't think it's better than the main series, but I think it's the most impressive thing he's written. That's fair. Like, I think it's the most difficult. When I read George, um, there's a few authors that do this for me, but George specifically, I'm like. I wish I could even tell the stories half as good as this. Like, I wish I could come up with the names, a plot that's half as good as this, the characters. Like, there's a piece of me that, like, likes creating things, and it's just, like, really intimidating to even Well, imagine. what you need to do is become a history nerd and then just add dragons. Right? Yeah, because that's all he did, right? I mean, it does help. <laughs> it, does, it certainly helps. <laughs> um, part of me wishes that he would pick different times in history. I mean, he does, but I would love to see, like, the Bronze Age collapse played out in a fantasy world i told that to uh steven erickson and he agreed with me um but i think it would be really difficult because no one really knows what happened when the bronze age collapsed like there were sea people that's all that people really know i don't well think it sounds that's... jimmy like that's the book that you should write they say write what you'd want to read yeah i'm too dumb <laughs> that's a, that's a problem intelligence is important uh, someone confidence said confidence uh, is important Yo, Hayden said, I'm excited for the opening theme for House of the Dragon. You're damn right. It's going to be awesome. I don't think it'll be as awesome as the Game of Thrones. It, nothing music. will ever be as awesome as that. That's the it greatest really, intro of like all Like, any time that I think that I'm like, I mean, Game of Thrones is good, but, you know. And then I hear the theme music, and I'm like, God, it was the shit. <laughs> because it's so just good. so hype. Like, it's so good. You can't have that awesome of a theme song and then put anything next to it. Like, whatever House of the Dragon is could be really sick. But you're always just gonna want that. Ba, 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 ba. They should I told, just reuse it. I told right? Hillary that there has never in the history of ever been better theme music, like a uh, show theme music, than Game of Thrones. And she'd never seen the show before, so I was like, and I was like, I am not overhyping this because it's impossible to overhype this. I was like, there has literally never been better. And so then I sent her, you know, just like a YouTube that's like the, you know, the opening credits, and she was like, okay, yeah, that that was amazing. No, <laughs> so I was like, yes, it was. The Light of the Seven is uh, one of the songs I like when I got to go to a dark place in the gym oh, I love and push it. through. I put on Light of the Seven. It, it used to piss my wife off because when when that came out, it was on my Spotify playlist because I just I it was so cool. And like I had already watched that intro to that episode so many times and she'd be playing music and all of a sudden that comes on. She's like, what the fuck am I listening to? And I was just like, don't worry about it. It's so past good. It's fine. Did it, did it. Oh, God damn. It, it, the beat so builds. It's incredible. That's, that's not, not popular. Uh, popular. We like Roy for nostalgia purposes, and that's about it. Yeah, Roy is uh, Roy's Roy, Rip Roy. But uh, except for that one person in my comment section that told me I was actually just false, and Roy is in fact a good narrator. Like I was just, I was just wrong. <laughs> he really made the work his own. <laughs> I had my facts incorrect, so I apologize. He's actually just the best. You know, I, I I have an appreciation for, it, but to say that you know, I mean, Simon Vance, Simon Vance is good. I Roy love, is um, the best narrator that there is for the Song of Fire and Ice. 
snowshoeing is about it. I I generally appreciate Brian chapters. They're my favorite. Was it Harry Lloyd? Who's with Sarah's? Yeah. Is that the name? Yeah. He killed it for Night of the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah, his voice just fit. Yeah. Well, and this stories. narrator like sounds like one you would want for a history book. Yeah. yeah. Simon Vance has a good Vance. voice. Yeah. I uh, I wouldn't mind uh, Jonathan Keeble doing the narration if we ever got another A Song of Ice Fire book. He does the Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan Keeble is just like when I was listening to it, I was like, oh, this is very similar <laughs> To a song of ice and fire, like this guy would murder it. He'd do. I also feel like job. the guy that does the um, Sun Eater narration. Would oh, be Samuel good. Sam Roken or yeah, Sam Roken, Samuel yeah. Roken. Oh. He's fantastic. Here, what? Share the the. Can we talk about how Fire and Blood provides a ton of evidence for Macer conspiracy? So, are we talking about just the Macer conspiracy of like removing magic from the world? Yeah, removing magic from the world, possibly having something to do with um, the fact that uh, dragons died out. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it definitely seems like they have a hand in it. They do not speak of dragons in the Targaryens very favorably, as we see. Um, in fact, Mushroom is a little bit more complimentary of the Targaryens than anybody. Who is it that's supposed to be telling this story? Uh, Septa, Septin, uh, blah, 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 narrator. It's, I think it starts with an M. But it's so it's someone from the faith. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. So there's already there's a type of spin to it. If it's someone from the faith. Retail. No, it says it's by Archmaester Gildane. Yeah. So that's who I mean. It's a maester, yeah. not a septon. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Did I say Septon? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, Maester. My apologies. I've had a little of a drink. Just a little. Just a small amount. <laughs> the gray rats are up to something. <laughs> Dude, the Citadel in itself is like my favorite thing. And that's like, I just, there's so much mystery there. I can't wait for Sam to go there. Maester, right? But uh, we do see the Septons and religion play a big role, especially with Aegon whenever he lands. Like it shows how big of a of an impact the faith had. And which yeah. again, like it's an. I mean, I've said this so many times about George's writing. We're like, it's a. Uh, you can see what parts of like religious history he's drawing on, but it also doesn't feel like oh, okay, so that's Catholic Church. It's literally just that. Like it has enough nuances of its own where it feels like authentic, unique world building while still being familiar in terms of the type of political situation that you end up with when you have mm -hmm. like the faith versus the crown. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely doesn't feel like a one for one with Catholicism. I don't think, which is cool, yeah. um, but it still is recognizable as like, Oh, these are the types of kind of problems that were yes, like there were with, with the Catholic church. Yes. And marrying your own sister pisses them off quite a bit. They're not fans. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, Not Henry the Eighth, like, he didn't want to marry his sister, but it was over marriage that he broke with the Catholic Church. <laughs> Which is uh, interesting because that that happens all uh, twice in Fire and Blood. Mm -hmm. um, and Henry the Eighth, uh, George is a massive fan of Henry the Eighth, so there's a lot of um, rumors and people, uh, you know, talk about how Henry the Eighth was possibly crippled. Is that correct? Is it crippled well, or he that he was he, syphilitic? Yes, syphilitic. Um, and people also question like how um, sound of mind he was whenever he ruled. And I believe that George is in the camp that actually in, like likes Henry VIII, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that that's why he writes a lot of his rulers similar to him. There's also a lot of um, comparisons between Henry VIII and Tyrion that people draw. Um, there's a lady, her name's Adrian Dillard. She's a good friend of mine. She's a, a historical fiction author. Really, really smart. And she has a lot of experience with the Tudor history. And I've heard her talk for like two or three hours about Henry VIII and how it impacts Tyrion in the series. It's fascinating. If you like history, it's just I'd love that. I, I should bring her on at some point and talk to her because she knows so much. Notably, more. Tyrion does not have six wives. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet. Yet. Yeah. And Tyrion's the youngest, um, which uh, I mean, as a as a similarity, because like. Henry VIII was not he was not raised to be king like he was the spare and it's because right. his older brother died that he took Sounds his older like brother's Ned Stark. wife. Mm. Sounds like Ned Stark. Yeah, honestly, it? Ned Stark is a lot. I mean, I'm, I believe you that Tyrion is inspired by him, but like Ned Stark situation where like he marries Catelyn because his yes. older brother was supposed yeah, to marry. That's exactly what happens yeah. to Henry VIII. Well, I should I, I should be more clear. There's pieces of Henry that are Tyrion very direct, but like he Henry VIII is all over the story because uh, Ned. I mean, Ned's a one for one with that, right? Mm 
but honestly like the the character the way he's portrayed um like just like you know demeanor and attitude that most reminds me of henry the eighth is robert baratheon yeah he's which is the ruler at the time right yeah and like his disdain towards his like lady wife and the way he likes he'd rather just drink and have a good time and like he's not really like he never really planned to be king like he wasn't exactly like no one raised him with that in mind no one knew this would happen and for different reasons because like henry is royal um there was a rebellion that put robert on the throne but same thing where like henry the eighth was like he was just like a party boy. Like he wasn't supposed to be king and he would yeah. rather just have a good time with his buddies than rule a country. Out. Sometimes you just want to bro out, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Derry uh, also had something nice to say in chat uh, that I think is true. She says in true groom style, he introduced how important the high towers are before. I think we see them in a song of ice and fire. Yes. With Euron coming down uh, to old town and Sam being there. I think the high towers are about to be very relevant in the main series. Um, yeah, Magor keep, yeah. keep trying to have a kid. It was exactly Henry VIII. <laughs> yep. And he yeah. keeps blaming all the wives. It's your fault. It's your fault. None of them are giving me children. You're like, mm-hmm. maybe it's you, Henry. I mean, Magor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. We don't blame the guy now. Come on. No, never. Never. Um, it does so get you- awkward, though, when you marry someone whose fertility was proved. And then you're like, well, I better not marry her. Because then like people <laughs> would be like, well, then it's definitely me. <laughs> yikes the, the pipes are busted um <laughs> when you guys were reading this uh, i mean i kept thinking about how it would impact the main series like going forward because he did decide to publish this book before winds of winter mm-hmm. which you know i'm sure part of it was the fact that he needed to get a book out or something but uh i do think that he definitely put information in here that's going to matter for instance the dragon not going beyond the wall Mm-hmm. But what I kind of took from this is that like the Targaryen dynasty has always been fighting itself to stay existent. Yeah. And I think more than ever, I believe that the main series is really about the last uh, the dying out of the last Targaryens being John and, and Danny. And Wait, but John's a snow. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, you're right. My bad. My bad. Okay, you've been drinking, Jimmy. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting my lore mixed up. I think Tyrion uh, is the Targaryen you're thinking of. Well, and, but to be honest, though, I do think that like even if John is a Targaryen, which I I think we all agree that he is. Yeah. Um, I, it makes too much sense. It makes way too much sense. And honestly, the series would be worse if he wasn't. Yeah, but um, also younger. I guess I mean, there would have to be something yeah, equally, younger. equally impressive that we haven't seen coming that would fit and be like, wow, how did I not see that coming? That checks all the boxes. We, You had us think he was a Targaryen, but it's actually this, which makes so much, you know, like it would have to be something. Yeah, there, there's some cool stuff out there, but it's not like our R plus L equals J without a doubt. Um, and now Jorah's I think Jorah's a Targaryen. Jorah, everyone's a Targaryen, dude. Grey Worm, bro. He's Valyrian. Well, if it's going to uh, maybe it'll be one of those Harry Potter Fantastic Beast switcheroos where oh they're like, God. OK, so oh, there was not. a baby with R plus L, but then that baby got switched. And so then like. There was a baby, You're but then me out. John is actually a different Stop. baby You're that got swapped. <laughs> you know the problem is if you talk for 20 minutes and you make a couple graphics on YouTube, I'll believe you. I know. <laughs> Do a TikTok on it and go viral. I'll go, you know what, guys? I'm starting to think that maybe we need to reread and that's <laughs> how conspiracies work, Jim. That's I just need a fancy YouTube video. You can't YouTube. prove me wrong. You can't if prove you get me a wrong. British accent, context. it's a wrap. And you make it fit your narrative. We used to do it with a British accent. Works. There's a really, really old stand-up from John Oliver where he's like, you know, you might have noticed that I will, that I'm speaking with a British accent. So just uh, the words you'll be hearing tonight will be presented to you with more authority than you're used to. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of took from this uh, this read through. I was just like, you know, uh, what do these initials? Ned ver- uh, Ned plus Ashara. Equals, equals Deezer. Wait, what is D? What is D actually? I I, I probably know, but I'm Danny. Daenerys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, get out of here. That's ridiculous. That's that's ridiculous, Vincent. How dare you? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do think that the Targaryen history is like clearly a pathway to show that, like, yes, the final crescendo of this series being a song of ice a dick being is Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, that a song of ice and fire's final crescendo is the last dying breaths of the targaryen dynasty like that's what we're reading or it's their resurgence dun, 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 the reason it's not going to be a resurgence though is because germ already said like danny's burning down king's landing 
Like, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. He's not gonna, gonna burn it down and then rebuild old Valeria. <laughs> Though I do th- that'd be sick. I'd be in for that. I do Unless think Unless John survives and actually takes the throne and is now the like new wave of the Targaryen dynasty. He said all the dragons are probably gonna be dead. So oh, well, that's dra- because though dragons, they're gonna definitely. get turned into undead dragons and we no. can't have that. Nice. Also, I do have to laugh at Miss Duncan's the Talls. Uh if I wonder if Fire and Blood Part Two, and that's all you need to to read in that statement. Is... <laughs> we'll come after a Dream of Spring, including the Danny, John, and Griff story. Oh, you know, that would be badass. I mean, like, let's just, just pretend like wishful thinking here, right? That wouldn't that be sick though if he finishes the it series would. and then you see this recap and fire and blood. I mean, that would be really to see how the history would be written, I guess, and then we actually read the story. Like that would that'd be cool. Uh, wishful thinking i mean as to why he came out with fire and blood before you know the next books um and you were saying might be because he wants us to know something for the next ones maybe um uh, i would guess and i obviously have no idea i don't know him but i would guess that like where he's at in the series like he has so many threads and so many things and so many corners that he's arguably written himself into and so many things have not gone exactly the way we know he originally kind of planned them to go he's like gone off course a bit and so then it is like really daunting to try to like write your way back out of that and like finish yeah. this out yeah and like you do sometimes have to like step away i'm not saying you step away for 20 years but like to step away and not just take time off but then like start talking about other parts of your world other times in your world and then like while doing that it's keeping the world in your mind and you're not not doing anything but it's helping you to like maybe work some stuff out in your brain about like what else is going on that might spark some ideas about how to like echo that or fix that or create new possibility that you were too close to it to see before. Now that you've written this over here, you're like from a distance, I can actually see how I can make this work. So like that might be why you wrote this first. And then like, if we are going to have basically spoilery things in the part two of fire and blood, then he does have to leapfrog back to the series before we get the other part of fire and blood. Yeah. And, and one thing that I uh, finished when I finished reading this, I, I, No, this will not be stuff anyone wants to hear. But if Fire and Blood 2 came out before Winds of Winter, I would read the hell out of it. Like, I I would love it. Of course you would. I want Winds of Winter more than anything. But if you more than world peace. Yes. If you give me a little more Duncan Egg or you give me a little more Fire and Blood, I honestly would be. I'd be fine. Nice consolation prize. Yeah, yeah, the hour of the wolf. Yep. Yeah, that was badass. That was yeah, super cool. Uh, and and someone was talking about. Uh, I think it was Hayden said. I feel all the history gives Brand so many possibilities, and as much as people meme on Brand, yeah, like well, because if you actually think about what he is, or like how powerful the three eye crow would be, if he actually has access to all of history. Mm-hmm. Like there, he could see so many cool things, and and also if he can influence it, technically the history yeah. we read is not actually written yet. Like, yeah, because I mean, if if you take bending. so like the Tower of Joy, which was like potentially one of the coolest things that the show was going to do, and then kind of like didn't go all the way with it. If Bran can actually do that and alter and like jump into people in the past and literally change things, like that's. He, he's going to be the super villain because he could just like do some crazy shit and it'd be awesome. But who has a better story Stop. than Bran the Broken? Potentially, that could be true if done better. It's just not in the show. It's just he has all the stories. <laughs> yeah. The show was just like, I have to go now. <laughs> and I'm just literally. I feel bad for the actor because he like didn't know what to do and didn't he's know what to do. So he was like, so I'm going to be sitting in a wheelchair doing and saying nothing for the rest of the show. Great. Yep. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no worrying a dragon or anything. Just nope. Just just, no. just went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, that won't work because everyone's going to read everything that George writes. Yeah, I sure. will say, though, the as I'm not saying the book is going to come out anytime soon, but this is the most that I've seen George like repeatedly mention wins, wins. in his blog. Yep. and say that it's, like, it's a gigantic book and it's probably going to take forever for him to even like parse that down or we're going to get a 1500 page win some winner and it would be sick 
but yeah, it does seem like, I mean, there's obviously been real progress made and he does edit as he goes, which is probably one of the reasons why he's so slow. Yeah. Um, but that latest blog post was uh, relatively positive. But I also wasn't as negative on the one that like set the entire fandom off and had like some of my favorite YouTubers like stop making content for the series. I was like, damn, I didn't take it negative at all. Interesting. Well, like, we've talked about this before that we're apparently unusual in the fact that we hold the view that authors are not our bitches and that like, yeah, I don't if, care that they write stuff we like. We are grateful for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like I've had so much fun going through, you know, this is what whatever time this is rereading it. But like rereading with you guys has been so much fun and it's never going to not be fun for me. I could be disappointed, but I'm disappointed by a lot of stuff in my life. I know Jimmy the... would. If I would not. Out, would y'all do another reread? Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I sure would. I mean, I would I would think about it for sure. I think I would. I don't know. There's so much content on the internet. Like I could just yeah. watch someone else explain the entirety of the series to we me. We could also just watch but our like, if it was, yeah. But if it was coming out, like, you know, you would like to build up the like waiting for it to like read okay, the books so... as the countdown to it coming out. And I would probably read out. Feast like, and Dance again. So that? if if Gurm came out and was just and like Fire and Blood and said like December 1st, 2023 is the release date. I'd be like, then it won't be, but five great. months prior, I would probably start a reread yeah. and just end right when it comes out. Yeah, it'd be. Oh, my God. I also if it was like, but if it was this internet. year, I wouldn't do it again because we just finished a reread. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, it won't be this year, unfortunately. Oh, I know. But like if well, Benjamin if, said 18 months, if it was that long. I mean, I would. Yeah. If I knew for a certain that it was then probably yeah because i read stormlight a year ago and honestly like i would love to read stormlight again right now like i've been thinking about it lately so i i'm i'm i try not to reread as much because like i want to cover new content on my channel and stuff but i do love rereads yeah they're so fun well if your content on your channel is not paying the bills then fuck it do whatever you want exactly that's why i do so many less videos now because i'm like I mean, I'll, I'll nobody is watching them. To. I'm not rolling in cash from my YouTube channel. It's like, You're not. I'm just I'm, I have made like three hundred dollars in two years. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I, I actually stopped monetizing any of my videos because I just don't care. But I just I, I do a lot less videos now because I'm like, I just I don't I don't want to make a video right now. I'm just not going to. So. Yeah, and it's almost like we just do this for uh, for the love of the game, as they say. We do for book fun. reports on the internet for funsies. Exactly. Yeah. That's why yeah. BookTube is. Hunter, uh, Hunter said something that's interesting. He said, on an individual basis, if Martin is unable to finish his series, then that uh, retroactively makes his previous setup less valuable. And in that, my, uh, in that case, my assessment of his author will go down. Yeah, and I've always said that it, if or when he does not finish his series, like then it is time to judge, right? Like where does that put him in the conversation for like all time greats and all this stuff? I can tell you from my individual basis that he'll still be my favorite author. I mean, it's but I mean, I don't, when you like, say, but also like previous setup is less valuable. I don't know what metric you're measuring value by because like that setup was, it's not like it wasn't there for a reason. And that reason never came to fruition because of like time and, and mortality. Um, but like, then it's still food for like what might have been and we would have notes to see like what he might have planned. So like I don't I don't know what valuable means. Well, and also are you talking about valuable for the genre? Because George is probably the most influential author since like Rowling and Tolkien. I would course. my guess would be valuable in the sense of like currently we all love it and we're still holding out hope that it's finished. But I could kind of see why like if it never actually does get finished then people could be really bitter and be like, well, then what was all this for? Yeah, like, there. Yeah, I, I agree. I can that. absolutely see a lot of people doing that. But there's there's always going to be people where, that say like us, like, no, just read the books because they're great. Like, yeah, it sucks that you're not going to get the payoff, but it doesn't lessen what mm -hmm. is there. You just never get the finality of it. Like, well, there also there's so many like yeah. um, buildings and monuments and things in history that they know, like in the time they were being built, they never got finished. Mm -hmm. And they are still places that people to this day visit and pay great, huge amounts of money to see. And because they were unfinished, did not make them less valuable. They are still cherished mm -hmm. and admired to this day. So yeah. I think if he I mean, I guess if he threw up his hands and was like, you know what, guys, 
I'm fine and I'm perfectly healthy and I plan to live another 60 years, but I'm not finishing the series because fuck you. Then I'd be like, yeah, okay, well then, sir. Well, <laughs> but- yeah, and it, it's also very different. Um, you know, a lot of people say George doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't know how to do that. I, I actually don't agree with that. I mean, he's made he has written hundreds of pages of Winds of mm-hmm. Winter. Um, I don't think he has any reason to really lie about that. Like he doesn't get like paid for lying about that. It's, Those same people probably think that Fire and Blood was like an easy cash grab. And you're like, you have no concept of how writing works. OK, <laughs> so, well, here's what happened. Someone said that on Reddit and then a bunch of people parroted it on YouTube. Uh. And that's what happened. I mean, that's how internet opinions work. You just rip other people's content and you act like it's your opinion. Um, to Hunter's point, though, of like, so you're saying if he doesn't finish it because he doesn't know how, that means the setup wasn't well-crafted. I see where he's coming from. I think it's more so that it's not that it's not well-crafted. I think he's pulled himself in so many different directions because he can't he can't help but like keep going with different plot threads. Mm. That it's like, how do I fit all of this into a book? and then finish yeah. it in two books. So like the fact that wins is as long as it is currently is probably because he set up so much shit and doesn't want to do feast and dance again, where he splits them up and has like 20 different POVs, but you have to split the book in half. So I think he's trying yeah. to fit a lot of stuff in wins and wrap up some of it. And then it would probably pare down for dream of spring because a lot of stuff would likely end by then. I think there's just so much going on that he's like, I don't, One, I mean, it's probably like to get in his mentality is probably impossible, but there's probably a lot of just like he wants to do it his own way. He doesn't Mm -hmm. want to disappoint people. He probably confused the shit out of himself, arguably, for many plot threads. And then there's some that he's probably just he wants to get it right. And I don't it's just hard. There's so much shit going on. He also has a worldview for Westeros and Essos. Like he Mm -hmm. he even said he said, I know like most of you only care about this one thing, but for me as a creator, I care about all of these things. And that pissed off it. so many people. He literally crafted this in his brain. Oh, like it's so impressive. We just get to read it. Um, I, and, and by the way, I, I mean, I disagree with Hunter on a personal basis, but I do think that it's valid that he uh, has that opinion. Like, I think there, there will be a lot of people who set it down and say, you know, forget this doesn't have an ending. I'm not one of those people. Uh, for instance, Alex, you're reading uh, Gentleman Bastards right now and, mm-hmm. and seeing how positive you are on it. Like, I'm going to read it. It's like, awesome. It's not, sounds dope. And you know what? Seeing how positive he is on it. <laughs> because I, I'm of the mindset because before I I was standoffish about it because I was like, why? There's three books. Well, this one I remember to be like yeah. seven. And, okay, and I will been... warn you, though, that like the, the ending of the third book is way more. Even more than a song of ice and fire is an ending where you're like, I'm sorry, you just left us there. Excuse me. (laughs) So that's going to suck. And it's the same thing with Rockfish. Like, I haven't read Name of the Wind yet. But again, like, I don't, I mean, when people talk about King Killer Chronicle, like, I'm like, yes, I want more because this is good and I want Mm -hmm. more. But King Killer Chronicle is very like journey and we are experiencing this life and it is interesting and it is poetical and I can reread it and Mm reread it and it's beautiful. And like, there are many things that are left, you know, as questions that I would like the answers to. And yeah. I would like another book, but it's not like you end Wise Men's Fear and you're like, oh, I must know. Whereas like yeah. Republic of Thieves ends in a way where you're like, I'm sorry. What? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, like that sucks, right? So if you just took like, well, I mean, think about the ending of Dance. Like if you end basically with all these cliffhangers that we have, like John literally just got murdered. And then it's just like spoilers. Come on. And then it's just like, OK, now what? Like we never get to see any of these like 30 different plot threads wrap up like that sucks but i'm not gonna i can promise you that nothing part. about where dance ends is as much of a what <laughs> as republic of thieves <laughs> well i'll find out in a couple months when i finish that and then i get upset at scott lynch for not finishing the books i mean i, I mean, put yeah. off reading republic of thieves because i was like i want to read it closer to when the fourth is announced and then that was taking a while so yeah. like three years ago i read republic of thieves and we are still <laughs> waiting for thorn of emberly i mean so yeah it's gonna suck when i catch up and i'm like oh shit the fourth book still is nowhere in sight but having read lies lakamora i absolutely adore it and at, like so much i'm not gonna turn this into that chat but like it fit a lot but of what do, i do because in the book, so about if you're interested in it, just read it because you're probably going to enjoy the hell out of it for what it is and just know that you're not going to get the series. Also, done. like, at least not so anytime soon. It's a good way to go. Obviously, about life. not with Republic of Thieves because of like aforementioned cliffhanger, but like lies can kind of be read as a standalone. Like, if you really didn't want it, to absolutely going, functions like, as a standalone because it, en- because at least at the start of this, it's like it ends, for, but like it ends that story. 
Yeah. So like it very much functions as like if you never got anything else, like that was just a really good book. And yeah. then maybe they had other adventures and it just never got published. But Republic of Thieves. Yeah. So that's different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not a standalone. <laughs> no. On a broader point, though, I think like taking things as they come and having leveled expectations is actually just a good way to live your life. Like it's hard yeah. sometimes, right? Um, that's how I approach most things, though. I don't think it is either. Yeah, I don't think I think especially us three doing the reread this time. Um, we appreciated a lot of stuff. I mean, like if we're saying bloated yeah. in terms of like here and there, could it have been edited down a little bit? I mean, yeah, sure, sure. All especially books. like the like Dance with Dragons. Yes, there's probably some things that like, especially some of the more voyeuristic things that like just like just cut that. Just just cut that out and everyone's better off. But like yeah. overall, like it's not a book that I would say this is a bloated book. Yeah, and, and a lot of the world building that he does is actually rather impressive in my uh, opinion. And I think if he's for crows, I mean Lena, you said you didn't like it the first read through, and this time you gave it five stars. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I hated it the first time. Right, right. It was more right. just like a. Meh. But there's a lot of goodness in a feast for crows. I think it, it's it's the book that gets like the biggest. Uh, it's clearly one of the it. weaker books, at least for me. It's one of the weaker ones, but like it's still a really good book. Well, yeah, like, Feast for Crows is kind of like the before they are hanged. Uh, and it took me an hour, almost two hours to mention First Law. So I oh think I deserve goodness. a drink for that. <laughs> but I mean, Before They Are Hanged is like the middle book of an already meandering trilogy. So like yeah. the first time and probably the second time that I read it, I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But like now that I've read it, um, it doesn't matter how many times, um, Before They Are Hanged is my favorite one because I think on, like the rereadability of it is the is the best. And so, like, I actually, for crows, I think the reread, like, on a second go through, like, I enjoy the hell of it. And I don't think that the first time through, it's likely that anyone would feel that way. It's only when you have hindsight and you have the expectation um, of this will be slower. Like, when you go in fully prepared and knowing what this will be, like, it's fantastic. I actually think I liked it more than Last Argument, though, because there was, without spoiling anything, there was some, like, magical elements of book three that I was like, okay, this is kind of dumb. And there were certain characters that I was like, I genuinely just don't like this person. And this is not that interesting. But books one and two, I think were better. Well, I thought like, I mean, most people, I think Last Argument is their favorite. And it was for me just because it's the one that like, after a, a lot of meandering, you're like, oh, okay. So like, actually this had a point. Yeah. And like, these are all the answers. And oh, oh my God, those are like legit answers. This all makes so much more sense now. So like that, like that last book gives you that feeling that you're like, mm -hmm. oh, but then like when you already know the answers on your like reread. Yeah. Um, then you're like, okay, I know the answers. Like, I'm not excited to learn the yeah. answers. I know. So, like, the journey becomes so much more about like what you're reading for. Sure. Yeah, well, think, it, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say reread is a totally different experience, right? Like, it's just it is. Totally I used to be very anti reread just because I'm like, I already read it. Like, what do I care? But <laughs> you're rereading a, a book, nerd. <laughs> no, but like, I'm a giant hypocrite because I will replay the same video game. That yeah, you will. That literally doesn't change on repeat. Like. <laughs> Final Fantasy you know, when we were I kids, we definitely watched 10. the same movies over and over and over and over again. You know, it's weird. I don't like rewatching movies. That. When you were a kid, I you didn't rewatch movies? Mm -mm. Like Disney movies? Like Nope. The only movie I rewatched religiously was Friday with Chris Tucker and Ice Cube. I love that movie Never so much. But like, I can quote all of Step Brothers, and I will still laugh the Never entire way through that, that movie. <laughs> Be like, it's like comfort food. But I think so justifiably for a lot of people, Feast is weaker and bothers people simply because A Storm of Swords is so fucking good. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you don't have half of your favorite characters in the next book because he wanted to explore other, this other happened, places. So like this, that. So I get it. But like the book is not bad and there's still very interesting things happening. Yeah. It sucks that you don't have most of the characters that you care about. Um and if you don't like Cersei, it's not going to. But gonna I love cool. Jamie. And she exactly. is. Jamie's the best. She's rather good. But then you get to wins. Or you get to wins. Do you get to wins? I know. <laughs> you get to Dance Dragons. And it's and then all of a sudden you have a lot of characters that you like again. And no. Yeah, you know, this happens in Berserk as well. As I'm reading through this, uh, the eclipse is like the big moment of Berserk. And everyone talks about it. It's like the storm of swords of Berserk, mm -hmm. right? And. I continued on and I was like, oh, it's not going to be as good as after. Take like, that comment off the screen. We're talking about a song of ice and fire. You don't have to leave up your Joe Abcrombie propaganda. <laughs> Leanna cannot help herself. I know. <laughs> I mean, facts are facts. And then, you know, I just like promoting the truth. Fact checker Leanna over here. 
Uh, I mean, like, I, we've talked about this before, and, like, I literally, like, did a chat with Jimmy talking about these authors specifically, like, where I was allowed to talk about Joe Abercrombie, <laughs> where, like, I, I, I am grateful that, unlike Jimmy, whose favorite is George R. R. Martin, my favorite is Joe Abercrombie, so mm-hmm. I'm grateful that my favorite author writes his trilogy as one book. draft yeah. and is like, I've written the whole thing and now we're publishing it in segments. Cause like, that's, that's very comforting to know that he finishes a project. But I also, I don't think that George R. R. Martin's a worse author. It's not like he's not my favorite they're because doing he hasn't things. finished it. Yeah. I mean, so they're like, also just completely different approaches to the same yeah. draft. And like, I don't think that saying, Hey George, do what Abercrombie does. And like, I don't care if that's not your style, do that. Like it would mm-hmm. be a crappy book if we yeah. made George do that. Well, George is writing epic fantasy, like to the traditional sense, the Tolkien sense. Yeah. Right. But and it's also Abercrombie's changed so much not. over the years. Cause like, if you go back to when he first started, it was going to be a trilogy. Mm-hmm. Like it's expanded since then. If he sat down in 1990, and was like, I'm going to write a seven book epic. And I'm which if he had read his wrote his trilogy all in one go, he would have known it wasn't a trilogy. <laughs> and we also would have but, saw John Mariaria and that would have been awkward. Yikes. I mean, Not he does like incest in this world. So. He's a big fan. It is amazing how like quickly, because I mean, partially like you already know before you pick up fire and blood that the Targaryens did this. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're like already ready for that. And then like, it it's not very far into fire and blood that i don't know about you but personally like when the faith is being like no you can't marry brother to sister i'm like why not they're targaryens like get over it <laughs> but see the faith the faith hates that but there's so many like other things that they're cool with that it's just like this sounds like the faith in, in our world i, I mean that's well i mean i one is the one of the parts and we like <sighs> you talked about um alisane visiting the um moles down but mm. like um when I loved that part of the book, the conversation that happens after, it's not just like, this is wrong and we fixed it. Like, it's more like there's the actual conversation that happens about that where they're like, you're going to piss a lot of people off. Like, we do we think it's right? No, we don't. But like, is it worth fighting over? Why did it cause a bigger problem? And the way that she's like, you know, the, the faith supposedly protects, you know, women and whatever. Like, why is the faith okay with this? Like, you shouldn't be. And they're like, you're right. We shouldn't be. And like that whole conversation that happens, it isn't mm-hmm. like, I mean, I talked about this about, in first law as well where like um now she's on a roll she can't help it anymore it's just gonna keep but like (laughs) when you present like i like when authors do that and we talked about it in the main series as well like when slavery comes up or things like that Mm -hmm. too where you present a situation and you don't have the protagonists show up and be like this is wrong and we fixed it and everything's fine now like they're presented as the complicated nested issues that they are where like we agree that having you know prima nocta is like well, it's no bueno but the fact that the conversation isn't like i had no idea this was going on immediately royal decree that is no more like they have an actual conversation about how, like, like, yay we're better this is a nuanced issue and like yeah i mean abercrombie does the same thing and i like that the, the main characters don't come in and are like this is wrong and we fixed it like no so hold on i first of all let's go back to the comment that we keep ignoring of who's your favorite targaryen uh ruler Jaharis the first. Jaharis is that, is that yeah. what I'm saying? Well, but it's also who is your favorite? This is always the question too. Like, who's your favorite? Like that you would want to be your king, or who is your favorite to read about? Honestly, I have a question before we do that. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> there is still this that exists. I mean, I'm not. I'm not opposed to this. <laughs> I knew it. Jimmy was like, I don't have time for Buddy Reads the rest of the year, but as soon as Alex breaks out World of Ice and Fire, Jimmy's like, I mean, I could make time, (laughs) if need be. (laughs) Well, a lot of it's from Fire and Blood, so there's a lot of sections you could glance over, look at the pretty pictures, and move on, which is cool. Um, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, by how many illustrations there are in Fire and Blood. Yeah, they're good, too. Yeah, they're good. I mean, like, I would be expecting and fully satisfied with, like, maybe five, you know? But, like, there's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a lot better than the illustrated editions, the anniversary editions of the main books. If they were as illustrated as this, oh, like that would have been sweet. Yeah, we do. We do have that dope Tyrion picture, though. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, god damn it! He's all man. Uh, one part of this book that I, I forgot to mention I really liked was Blood and Cheese. The, like the assassin and the like the muscle like the assassin the, or the, the dirty deed doers for like, da- how dare uh, anyone say this book Damon? isn't interesting and suspenseful and emotional because that part of it I was like, oh my god, what are they gonna do? And he cuts Jerry's head off. You're like, what the fuck? 
And then like literally like it's Sophie's choice when like they make the mom name a child to kill. Like that's literally Sophie's choice. Yeah. And then like and that she ended up killing herself, right? Doesn't she? She throws herself out a window. Supposedly, some people thought she was and murdered. And then later, by... the daughter also throws herself out the window. Yeah, dude. Blood and cheese. I mean, I hope we get to see that on screen. Like that. Which is interesting that like they. I I don't know if that was like on purpose on George R. R. Martin's part that he didn't, or he was like the rules don't apply here, or he didn't think mm-hmm. of that. But like often, I mean, I watch. I don't like reading a lot of like murder mysteries or crime books but i like watching shows like that a lot um yeah, it's yeah. very satisfying that there's a who done it you find out who did it and like yeah. yeah but anyway usually when it's like a suspected suicide the the conversation always goes to that women tend to choose less violent methods of suicide and that men would be more likely to like slit their throat or shoot themselves and women are more likely to like poison themselves um, and so then like both mom and daughter, because there is rumor about like, well, were they murdered? And like to throw yourself out of a window and impale yourself is decidedly a violent way to kill yourself. And so like, yeah. I don't know if Targaryens are different. George doesn't care. It's also not like scientifically proven that women will never choose a violent end. But like that's never brought into question as like a would a woman do this? Yeah, I mean, that's a statement uh, a suicide, I would say. Uh yeah, Which, like, especially for the little girl, would a little girl care to make a political statement by impaling herself? Good Probably question. Not. not actually a bad point. Yeah. Targs think they can fly. Well, we also know there's a Targaryen that thought that he uh, could turn himself into a dragon, right? Mm-hmm. We met him in Dunkin' right. Egg. Eight well, there's also fire. the part where, like, he's not a Targaryen, but uh, what's her name's husband, who's like, you fly around, I'll fly. And he like goes out the window and kills himself. So like, <laughs> there's also that. <laughs> what the which which the dipshit fire? was that that drank wildfire? Uh, I just remember it was from Dunkin' Egg and it was the one brother that was the asshole that Dunk whooped his ass and almost died for it. <laughs> Dude, Dunk just whooping a prince's ass. Yeah. God. What, what so a Chad. Good. So good. Was it through what? What were you guys talking about? We were just talking about how did it happen? Was it their decision to do the switch for a sick near twist? Oh, yeah. Was it Blood and Cheese's decision to, uh, to cut off Jaharis' head? Because, like, you know, she picks the other the um, the other son, right? Mm-hmm. So did Rhaenyra tell, him, tell Blood and Cheese to do that? Or are Blood and Cheese just, like, sick individuals? Well, yeah. I think it's unlikely because, like, the way that comes about, like, they couldn't have planned for like meeting her with the kids and this, ha- you know what I mean? Like that situation was very like, it's like of the spur of the moment we're presented with mom and the kids, you know, like you couldn't really plan that situation. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say no matter what she says, take, take the air, but right? like, there's take no, the there's the no air. guarantee that she would have even seen the mom. Like you could just sneak in and kill one of them. You know what I mean? No, that's true too. Yeah. That's like, fair. you couldn't think like, Maybe if they're like, just, okay, so in the unlikely event that you see all three together, you are to ask the mother, and then you are to do the opposite. Like, it seems unlikely that you'd plan that ahead. Yeah, that's a lot of planning. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, Blood and Cheese. What an interesting... There could be short stories about them just doing uh, Damon's dirty deeds. And like, okay, so as much you know as... Um, the fan base would be? As much as Viserys' brother, like, the at the beginning, you're like, what an asshole, where he's like, you know, he likes to hang out with the gold cloaks, and he just like, you know, he clearly wants power, and he's like real pissed about not being next in line, like, he's kind of a dick. But then, like, later, much, much later, when he's able to get into King's Landing because the gold cloaks, they're still his dudes, I was kind of like, yeah, they are! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Damon, uh, man, he's, he's, a, he's a dastardly guy. Um, he does some pretty crazy stuff. Like I the mean, war on he those reminded me of Jamie Lannister. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit quite a bit and then he ends up marrying his like really young what is it niece or whatever like they're yeah. they can't be separated i'm like oh i'm sorry that's the marriage in this book that you are well he kind of he kind of groomed her i mean let's Lucky. be honest damon's a groomer confirmed i mean he is but again like i don't think that's the worst thing in this book that <laughs> we needed a chris done. hansen character to sit him down it's but- not nearly as creepy as that um what's the witchy lady who um like bewitch she's, she's like three decades older um and oh. like uh but which is i'm gonna say what's his name what's her name for most characters <laughs> <laughs> no one honest. no one remembers them all except for mrs duncan the talk like the one that did this is how i remember them. yeah 
Which is isn't that how we kind of remember our historical <laughs> figures too? <laughs> you know, four score and seven years ago, whoever that was. I, I mean, especially with, but with the European history, and you have all of the like, <laughs> you have so many Henrys, and like, unless they did something real significant that you like Henry the Eighth, you're like, yeah, that sticks out. But all the other Henrys, you're like, yeah, I couldn't God, tell you about one Shakespeare seven. can help me remember that. <laughs> couldn't tell you about one through seven. Not a chance. <laughs> Like, I only know Henry V because of Shakespeare. <laughs> if he hadn't written such a good play about him, I'd be like, he's one of the Henrys. <laughs> <laughs> KJ says the Hall stuff is weird, is all weird in this book. None of it is very focused, but I like it. I agree. I mean, you can see why. And Hall, like we see Heron, right? Um, mm -hmm. Get his line, does not see another day. And Aegon yeah. wipes him out. And it's like, man, Hall does appear to be cursed. <laughs> yeah. That's why everyone says that. And that's why it's haunted and cursed. Yeah, the witch at Heron Hall and Eamon. Yep. Wasn't it Rainey's who like goes to Heron Hall and is like, I'm not oh, like I'm not seeing any of my visitors. Like they're like, there's people who come and they're supposed to give them like queen's rights or whatever, and like meet them for dinner. And she's like, nah, you'll get whatever I got in the cupboard and I'm hanging out in the tower. I don't give a shit about any of you. I just thought that was the best. I'm like, that's the life I want to live. So you basically want to be little finger like on the fingers. Yeah, with none of the scheming. Like, <laughs> leave me all out of that. Miss me with that. I don't want any of that. Leave me on the fingers. Taking a sword through the chest for, like, mid Liza Tully. Like, come on. <laughs> what is uh, what Rogar says to uh, the one dude? It's like, my daughter should marry the prince. And he's like, your, your daughters have no brains and no chin. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I did laugh at that dude, i laughed so hard at that. but also like at the end with Aegon, um when he wants to what what they call her like miss tula to is it two turnips turnips turn up miss turnips what do they call her turn up yeah, miss turn up yeah is it miss it's not miss lady turnips yeah we'll go lady turnip i think it's, it's something to do with turnips because like he's remember. trying to get his daughter to like the hand is trying to get his daughter to marry the king and everyone's like no no you can't and he's like okay we're gonna have a ball and she'll be front and center <laughs> like she'll she'll have plenty of dates with him beforehand and then he feels personally betrayed by the fact that this scheme didn't work and you're like sir <laughs> he had no idea <laughs> can we um can we briefly make fun of the show again and talk about how bullshit scorpion bows are in the show compared to the the one historical contextual moment that we have of Maraxi's well, taking because they didn't have eye. Euron around. Euron is the shit. Because he was a sharpshooter. No problem, yeah. Because Maraxi literally takes a bolt through the eye, which is the only reason that that dragon dies. Yeah. But anyway, you know, they can't well, just... Well, I feel like even in the show... Pierce through like, an entire um, dragon body. Daenerys dragons have like personalities and until the end, at which point they just become like beasts for plot convenience. Cannon fodder. I also would say that uh, we were talking about the lost eggs earlier. One of the reasons mm -hmm. why I actually think that it is Daenerys' dragons because yep. dragons to the point where they were dying out were so small and like neutered. Mm -hmm. And Danny's dragons like They're grew. Tiny. Yeah, like they grew vastly larger than the ones that were left at King's Landing. Um, a couple hundred years prior, so I definitely think the lost eggs were um, were likely the ones that Danny got. Vincent Brown said the quote for Lenore uh, Valerian made me laugh. I don't like fish, but when it's served, I eat it. Speaking of how Lenore was not actually, you know, he wasn't interested in women per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. That like is interesting. Like, I mean, I have neither the patience the time nor the interest to like do this but like i would love to find somebody that did it for me and like analyze the way that queerness is alluded to throughout this book because like it's not not alluded to it's alluded to frequently yeah, yeah. and then you got renly from the main series right mm -hmm. but i mean in renly like uh i don't know with the main series it is more narrative but in this like history text the way that queerness is mm -hmm. like just the fact when and where it is but also like the manner in which they go about saying it without saying it Yes. Yeah. And Lenore's not really like frowned upon in the history either. Like there's really, I mean, they note it, but it's, it's not a negative connotation. I don't think it seems very kind of like Roman and yeah. like, a, yeah. you know, okay. Who cares if you like get off on that? You have to make heirs. <laughs> like, that's yeah. all we care about. Boys will be boys, you know? Yeah. But even for the women like that are queer, like they don't really shade that that much. They're just like, as long as you make babies, like we mm -hmm. don't care if you think it's fun. If yeah. you would have more fun with the ladies, be our guest as long as occasionally you do your duty and make an heir. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Reyna is a lesbian openly, Hunter says. Then that's correct. Yep. Yeah, this lady and all of her really close lady friends like, come on now. <laughs> we we know what that means. But then it's interesting how is it Alyssa that is kind of queer coded, but she like is obsessed with her brother and like um, yeah. the one that she marries and like she unfortunately dies in childbirth like many of them do. Um, yeah. But like she like ha has the like stereotypical coding of like she likes to fight. She likes to wear trousers and oh. she doesn't like to wait was be that girly. The was that the one uh, I think it's Jaharis's kid or was it Viserys kid that like like the kid was really young and they sent her off to get married and she died during childbirth and they were like we no, no 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 all of that I did want to bring up that as, like, oh, that, was that made me brutal. very very sad that was like the brutal. letter that she's like oh okay anyone again who says this book doesn't have emotions in it like the part where she sends the letter to mom that just says I'm scared oh I was like that's it's brutal that's so sad mm -hmm. and then she Dies. And even before that, like, I mean, you <laughs> get you get where her dad is coming from when he's like, she's got to marry somebody. But you yeah. also like seeing how how terrified she is all the time. And it's kind of funny when they're like, you know, she thought she liked cats until one scratched her and then she was terrified of them. And you're just like, it's kind of funny, like the amount of stuff she's scared of. But then like this, this like completely fragile little scared thing that you're mm -hmm. like, she's got to marry somebody. And the way that like she's like well he seems nice and he'll protect me so i'll chick pick him and then she's like the idea of her being pregnant which is like knowing what had to have happened in order for her to be pregnant and mm -hmm. you're like that already i there's no way she wasn't scared of that and then like yeah. being pregnant is scary even for the like the strongest of women and like i just my heart absolutely broke for her i was like this cannot end well and it didn't and then yeah like the schism between mom and dad like is understandable when she's like you didn't have to push her into marriage we have tons of kids would mm -hmm. it have been so bad if this like delicate innocent little flower didn't marry somebody immediately and this is what killed her and you're like i mean you're not wrong yeah that's probably one of the best moments in, i mean it's one of the saddest moments but i think it's one of the best moments in the book yeah vincent we talked about uh, prince area earlier uh, in mm -hmm. her having little worm egg things underneath her skin and how yeah. absolutely terrifying it was. Full on horror. Probably be my f pick for favorite moment of the book. Probably. It's definitely the most horrifying. Yeah. Anything that does with the doom in Valyria, I'm in. Like, I'm this just is still so mysterious. It's so mysterious. And honestly, I don't actually want the answers, but I also do. Like, that's the best feeling is whenever you're like, yeah. I wanted to be ambiguous, but I also just need to know a little bit more. Leave just it alone. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Like you, you want answers, but in truth, you know that if you had them, you would be less satisfied. It's like the it prequel they're gonna do. It's like I don't need yeah, to know. Like the it Pennywise came prequel. Out. It's what are we doing? Stop it. it! And it'll probably be good. That's a problem. It's probably gonna be actually really good. But like, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want it. Is okay, uh, is so. Stephen King actually writing a prequel book no. for it, or is it's it just be a shit. prequel no. movie? Nope. Is Stephen King involved in the creation? It's a of it? show, I think. I thought it was a sh uh, maybe. But I mean, like having an explanation oh, for something like, inexplicable it's... defeats the purpose of having something inexplicable. Yeah. yeah. So again, I always go back to my main uh, alien comment. You don't need to ex over explain with multiple prequels where uh, the alien came from. It's Even a cool not. monster. I don't need to know its origins of so like, no. I like Prometheus. I'm like the only person. I know you do. I'm I enjoyed Prometheus, but I do acknowledge every single flaw that it has. Like I it, liked it's watching like it, but it, but even you right. like this Prometheus. But like, actually, I couldn't remember it. if it was like, you that liked Prometheus, and I wasn't gonna like bring it up and like make it because it's embarrassing. Because I actually have the Blu-ray of Prometheus. All right. But um, like when we were talking about uh, what's her name coming back from Valyria, presumably. Mm -hmm. Um, and things coming out of her that's it's a very like prometheus like that the black stuff that's like gets under the, the skin mm -hmm. and like comes out again like that's a very like the vibe is very similar to like what's described yeah. as happening to her yeah uh vincent apologize you don't have to apologize vincent it's all good dude you just weren't here earlier that's all good mm -hmm. uh, and, and i actually said the same thing you did you said the fact that black dread has wounds is really scary that's what i said like what the hell did that to him He's more dragons blood. Well, in the words of Qui Gon Jinn, there's always a bigger fish. It that would be, be horrifying. It just yeah. never leaves, but there's a dragon twice the size of Balerion. That'd be sick. Would I be feel sick. like it could never be a something as like straightforward as just, oh, it's a bigger dragon. What if it was the yeah, Kraken? What if, what if it's the Kraken? Release the Kraken. Another Liam Neeson <laughs> line. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Balerion would fuck a Kraken up. Just sure would. I mean, 
It would eviscerate. It would, we would all be having calamari. A tomorrow. squid against a giant fire-breathing dragon. The rat. Yeah. Not a chance. Like, hey, what you if have it's a million a fire arms? Breathing it's going to literally set you on fire. <laughs> yeah, why do dragons only get to breathe out? Like, why isn't there any, like, ice hawks? You know? Like, ice they hawks. release ice? I don't know. Ice, ice dragons when the ice Night dragons. King spears one. And... <laughs> there I mean, is there's also something about, but, dragon. like, Ridley Scott loves using flamethrowers. So I feel like because fire is cool between the flamethrowers and the blackness under the skin. Prometheus has got a lot of things in common with the world of ice and fire. People like fire. Oh, you got a nice comment, Liana. From Zero said, hello, Liana. You obviously don't, uh, Obviously, don't know me, but I have been following your IG and your YouTube for three years now, and I think you have inspired nice. me to read many times. Greetings from the NYC. You guys are great. I think Leanna was entirely suspect of where it was going to go when you said you have a comment. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll be honest. I had to read the whole thing and, and check it out. You never know what happens on YouTube. That was a nice comment. Yeah, that's very nice Listen, to hear. Aiden, the Kraken's a water animal. Okay, but Balerion is like a level 100 Charizard fighting a fucking Squirtle. Okay? Yeah, you can have your resistance. Kraken wouldn't do anything. It would yeah. get burned alive. <laughs> It would boil the water that the Kraken's in and it would die. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would eat it. Listen, every time the Ironborn try to buck back, they get smacked. Let's be honest. Because the Ironborn suck. But the Iron Islands are so awesome. But they suck. Stop it. They're cold, miserable assholes that really Leanna, I want you to make a video. want to be Vikings. They're yeah, I want you to make a video about this and say, in defense of the Iron Islands. You can only defend rapist raiders that just want to pillage I'm and sorry they're the only rapists so in Westeros um no. I, I said more in that sentence <laughs> it's like it's like literally rooting for the Vikings like it, at a certain I point, mean have you met me <laughs> I mean, you haven't met me but <laughs> listen so, I like Vikings as much as the nice guy but there are several times when I'm just like damn they're like the bad guys aren't they <laughs> yeah they sure are they're like, so this spring, these are the places we're going to invade, exactly. conquer, rob, yes. rape, and come back with some gems and things. Finland saga mm -hmm. made me realize, I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. these guys are pretty bad. <laughs> it's like that Mitchell, did I send you that Mitchell Webblick sketch? Um, yeah. I sent you a lot of their sketches where they're like, it's the Nazis, and they're like, are we the baddies? <laughs> mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> the Iron Islands suck. Bunch of cold weirdos that drown each other. This is really random and like, I mean, this isn't, I don't know. I'm, well, I'm sharing it anyway. Here comes um, a Joe Abercrombie comment. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Um, they're, uh, you know how, I don't know if this happens to you, but like uh, if there's a certain period of your life where like you either happen to revisit and get obsessed with or discover like a particular artist or album and you're like listening to it a lot. So then like stuff that was going on in your life is like tied to like, Oh yeah, your thoughts and memories of that, and you might have been listening to it because it seemed to be so relevant to what was going on with you. Yep. So, like in college, is mainly when I read. Well, it was when I the first time I read the Song of Ice and Fire books. It was all throughout college, um, and a Flogging Molly album had album had just come out, and one of the songs on the Flogging Molly album was like something to do with the sea and it was like kind of metal sounding in a floggy molly way and it was the iron island sound to me and i was like loving that new album listening to it all the time and so then like i don't maybe that's why i love the iron island so much because to me it's like it that flogging, flogging molly, molly song that i like i was obsessed with that's cool at the time yeah it's like your own soundtrack that's cool but i definitely have that uh i was just listening to toxicity by system of a down recently I was just remembering. My brother like, was obsessed with System of a Down, so I heard it a lot. Toxicity is one of the best okay. albums ever. I got to pee real quick. I'll be right back. Not allowed. Good I do like System of a Down. My brother listened to it a lot more. So, uh, uh, the lead singer did a Reigns of Castamere cover for season eight, and it's phenomenal. Although, speaking of covers, I have to say, when I you know, like share on in my Insta stories like about these live shows, and like most of the time, I'll like try to add music that's like from Game of Thrones to it. And the number of like, uh, surprise, it's a metal cover <laughs> that like, I click on. Then I'm like, oh, this is like Jenny of the Old Stones. And then I click on it and it's like, Jenny! <laughs> like, oh, it's she not Jenny. Of the old old to leave. <laughs> Dude, that's a lot. Hey, listen, everyone, you can say what you want about season eight, but we got Jenny of the Old Stones. And honestly, it was worth but it. The best version of Jenny is pod singing it. Yeah. Because that, like, I mean, I'm a sucker what a great for episode. like acapella single. Mm -hmm. voice like yeah. it's just so powerful that's probably why i like the dwarves singing and top it so much 
How long do you think Alex would last if he got sent to the wall? Um, one day. I give it. I give it like a day. <laughs> I think he could smooth talk his way into a second day. But I feel like he'd become a steward and they would he'd be like, this is bullshit. Like we're doing all the work. And they would be like, hang him. <laughs> How long do you think you would last at the wall? Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd be fine. I'd be ranging beyond the wall. I'd be bedding wildlings. I'd be going to Moles Town constantly. I mean, I would totally. be fine. What if I'd... they made you a steward though? They made me a steward. I'd hang myself. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely be oh, a deserter. Bye, I'm Derry. See you, Derry. Always good to see you. Lord Commander Jimmy, you're damn right. You're damn right. I would I would kick Alistair Thorne in the nuts. <laughs> I'd hit him with a stone cold stunner. If he can work. I could work. Favorite minor character, easily Rogar Baratheon. Not even close. It's definitely Rogar. Of course, Corlys Valerion's a main character, in my opinion, so I can't pick him. So it's definitely Rogar. But is this question definitely about only fire and blood? Yeah, in I think so. Which case that is, because that also could be your answer for all of the books. I mean, honestly, Rogar is that cool. I think, is Robert Baratheon a minor <laughs> character? Technically? I'll just tell you that you know nothing all of the time. Oh, you're definitely a wildling, without a <laughs> doubt. Without it, it's you like, know nothing. You know nothing, Jimmy Nuts. Doesn't have the same. Doesn't come off the tongue. Doesn't, you doesn't know also... nothing, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, you'd be a wildling, or you'd be out on the Iron Islands resuscitating people. I mean, I appreciate gun. that you don't think I'm a whore of Molestown. No, you're not appreciate a mole. <laughs> no, Molestown uh, requires a certain musk. You know, it's just <laughs> you got you got to be down bad. We should like honestly. That's a good question, though. Who goes? Who goes? You know what? You know what? You know what it is for me. I'm going to Moles. Like, <laughs> I mean, Craster's I like daughters? the self awareness. <laughs> yeah, like Craster's daughters, maybe if they can get you know into the wall. Like, well, it's better than that old crusty dick, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's honestly like, in the world of Eyes and Fire, there are worse fates I could think of than being a lady of Molestown. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, yeah. No, I wouldn't say it's pleasant, but yeah. I mean, right. definitely better that than Craster's wife, daughters, daughter wives. If you could live anywhere, though, in, in the Seven Kingdoms, where would you live? It all seems pretty awful, but... Or, or would you go to, like, Essos? <laughs> like, are you going to be, like, a little more European? Well, I mean, is this... Is the question taking into consideration the current political situation and strife? Because, like, I mean, Winterfell seems great, but also, also it got burned down by the Greyjoy. No, so, no, like... no. This is just, like, in general. Like, if, if everything's going peachy. Everything's going peachy. Um, probably Winterfell. Yeah, you like the cold. Yeah. What about Winterfell? Where would where would you live in Essos or Westeros? Dorn. Alex. Yeah, Dorn. I'm going Dorn. Rose safer. People are more. So kind. like you guys live in cold climates and I don't. So I basically live in Dorn and you guys basically live in Winterfell. So we're just if you're trading. In LA to Dorn, then. You must live around like the nicest people that are really accepting of each other. And I mean, I like the fact that I have to, t uh, I could have spicy food, menage a trois. I mean, yes, they have fiery Dornish peppers that were mentioned here and there. <laughs> yes, just a bit. You know what fire and blood is missing is the quintessential food talk conversations. There is no food mentioned. <laughs> so true. They yeah, actually is... live in the uh, Iron Islands because they're so cool. Yeah, we, we asked uh, the viewers, we said, how long would Alex last at the wall? And I said, uh, maybe a night. <laughs> I, That's I gave what we you said. Days. I gave you two days. <laughs> I, I said, said a day. You, I be... hate being cold. <laughs> and I hate asshole cool people. <laughs> so if I was in a permanently cold place, surrounded like, by a bunch of assholes, me, one way or cold, another, I'm, I'm out of there. Being cold either and having a fire and is such a novelty. Or... <laughs> no, someone's killing me. Being cold and, and needing a fire is such a novelty to me. That's probably why I think that Winterfell sounds so nice. I'm like, oh, like fur cloaks and sitting by the fire. Oh. And it's also wintry. And they have like, I don't know. It sounds nah. great. Uh -uh. Nah, it's nah I'm being cold sucks. Because I mean, I've no. lived in LA without an AC. And that's what Dorn sounds like to me. And I'm like, 
No, I'm good. <laughs> now, day two of winter, you're like, I'm pretty much over it at this time. See, what I have said yeah, for all of my itself. life, what I've said for my whole life is like, if you're cold, you can put on a sweater. But yeah. if you're hot, there's nothing you can do. You can jump in a pool. Literally nothing. Jump in a pool. The issue, but if you though, don't have a pool. All right. But so in these scenarios, quit being poor. all you have are your furs, your stone keep that you're in. And a fire. And also Winterfell and, is heated it, by hot springs, like in the wall. Let's There's also a notable lack of brothels. Which we also I'm have okay to be clear, with. <laughs> what rank are you where you're staying? Are you I'm assuming peasant? I'm nobility. I am a star. Oh, you're just assuming. <laughs> of course. <nobility>. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, I just want to be a part of House Dane. I just want to be the sword of the morning. Of That's all I want, guys. Do you want to die? Yes. yes. <laughs> Every day. I feel like uh, if I went to the wall and like Alice just Thorne started yelling at me, I'd be like, shut the fuck up. And then I'd get beheaded. <laughs> That's what I said would happen. <laughs> you know, I'd honestly. I executed immediately. I said honestly, you would get placed as Stuart. You go, this is bullshit. And then hang you. I you would know what so sounds fast. like probably the most ideal place to live is High Garden. Probably. Yeah. Is that like High Garden? You know, like. I mean, they do have a lot of bullshit. That's not what I meant for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like. Because if so, I'm down. Wait, Alan's doing rating sprints right now, by the way. I just got a notification. Um, How I dare he try to challenge our live show? <laughs> Maybe he's trying to catch up on the Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> That's exactly what he's doing. I did create some fire fire. it. You know, it's how me and Alan met, like, officially, was he was in my chat, and he was shitting on Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons, and I was like, how dare you? I was like, you <laughs> should come on the next episode, and I'll argue with you. And then we did it, and by the end, he was like, I want to reread these. These, these sound great. <laughs> It's a beautiful hate to love romance story. <laughs> uh, it was. It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. But yeah, Fire and Blood was dope, guys. It was awesome. There's probably so much of the actual book that we didn't talk about, but oh, tons. Uh, there's That's no fine. way you could remember all of it. Like, there especially a lot of names. <laughs> I mean, there's so much. I mean, I will say this. I could see. Actually, it. I know there's content for it on YouTube, but I'm surprised that more people haven't made like videos like lore videos there's so much fan art there's illustrations well i'm book. guessing when this book came out it was at a point in time when people were bitter that this is what it was coming when out, did it come as out? opposed to 2017 or 16 i think or i might be wrong it might be 15 fire in blood 18 what yeah 2018 no. i just have to say like the whole time that i was reading this i couldn't stop being impressed the mm -hmm. whole time i was just like i mean there's like multiple levels, right? Especially when you're a reviewer and you're like, how am I going to talk about this? And like, how's it compared yeah. to other things, whatever. And like, I was personally on an enjoyment level enjoying it. Yeah. But I was also the entire time I was like, and the way you just made this seem like a history book by doing that. And the way you just actually thought of that and the way yeah. that you actually made this little detail in it, make it feel more real. And the way that you actually thought of all these plot lines, I was just the whole time gobsmacked. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed it even more than I thought I would. And I was kind of curious to where I would be at because I read uh, two other books that are kind of history based in a little bit, a little distance narrative. So Grace Kings. And then I finished up the World of Lord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. And I was like, I wonder if I'm going to be burnt out on that kind of like distance. The Warlord has a more, more of a narrative, though, right? It's not, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it so it's like, like I love The Last Kingdom. And that's the, the only like historical fiction that I've read. But it's like you're following characters in a story. You're not just reading like the history of the Saxons. No, yeah, you're not. And even in Warlord, you're not. But it's it's like distance sometimes because like you jump over sure. like months, right, in a paragraph. Like they're mm -hmm. like, okay, and six months went by. Well, a lot of like um myth and fairy tale retelling can also have that kind of like arm's length Tolkien yeah. kind of like. It's not and, really that, and that same Grace of Kings has a very <laughs> good narrative, but it does start out very much like broad strokes at first. Um. But with Fire and Blood, I really enjoyed it. I actually wanted to put out a review of it, and I still might. But like dealing with oh, that was so good. The that part, part I forgot about it until literally the second. Steve as plague. Oh yeah, because they end up disproving it. I think it's the Maester that does. But right? I just I that was the one part of okay. As much as I liked it, that was the one part of it that I was like, okay, you didn't write this though as a history text because you introduced it as plague came to this place and then told us that actually uh, we realized that it. it was poison. And I was like, a history text would say, as we know, at the time they thought this was plague, yeah. but it wasn't. And like you didn't say it like that. You made us think it was plague, and which is what a novel yeah. does, not a history text. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, 
That's a fair point about like the females specifically in Fire and Blood because they're all Targaryens and Targaryens are just badasses. But like yeah. so are so are Dornish people, right? It's Dornish. It kind of depends on like where Yellow Toad. What, like like what part of the world you're in. But Targaryens especially. Like women flying dragons that don't take shit from people. Like yeah. And Allison Hightower, I mean, she does kind of weasel her way in, but like she's mm-hmm. a she's a very strong um character. Andrew for but also Andrew how many Farman. so many names in I mean the world of ice and fire but in this book because there's so many names you see more of it they're like um what is that it's not a, a board game because there's no board but that game where like the card on it has written out something that you're it looks like gibberish and then and maybe it's called balderdash I don't know but hmm. like when you read it out loud then like it sounds like an actual sentence of words because it's like written out phonetically what a sentence sounds like in english and like the game is like you're supposed to like read it out loud and then like your team is supposed to be able to like figure out what it is you're saying because it sounds like actual words when you say it out loud anyway the point is the names in this book on paper they're like oh these are fantasy names but then you say it out loud and you're like it's literally eric allison (laughs) (laughs) but you just put some y's and some e's in there and made it look fantasy but then you said it out loud and you're like oh that's just a really straightforward name yeah that's andrew that's andrew (laughs) <laughs> yeah i really enjoyed this I, I i might even put out a review for it at some point just talking about how much more i enjoyed it than i thought i would from cover to cover but i also always like dread the comments on george videos because you know what it half of them are just going to be where is wins bro yeah wins and season eight and you're just like i know guys you know what's you get it you know what's the greatest part about that though is if it's on your video you can just Walk block them start blocking or hide their chain or hide their comments this is nothing or to respond do. to them and say shut the fuck up asshole <laughs> I did. that's the wonderful thing about youtube it's your dude, you can also I say wanna... thanks for the engagement yeah right <laughs> no Deshauna's the goat dude watching her roast people in her comments is like my favorite thing and the times when you like complain to her about your comments she's like i can tell them this i won't if you don't uh-huh. want me to no. but i can dude she's awesome <laughs> But um, speaking of comments, has nothing to do with um with these books. But do you get comments from people that are telling you what this person is like thinking before watching your video, and they don't say anything about having watched it? They'll be like, "Oh, I'm interested to hear what you're going to say about X, Y, and Z." And you're yeah, like, I've had that. Yeah. "So, but like, what what did you think about? What, what was the point of that? <laughs> do I get a follow up? Like, what, what am I supposed to, like? So, how did it go? <laughs> yeah." <laughs> That's why they want to comment first, so everyone sees their comment. Not always, yeah. though. First, first, bro. Yeah, I've had I've had uh, precursor comments. I've also had uh, other creators that uh, comment, and uh, the video has been out for thirty seconds. Great video, bro. And I'm like, you watched it real fast. <laughs> if you've ever done that, I've unsubbed from you immediately, just so you know. <laughs> it's just so disingenuous. Like, I don't care. Don't watch. Like, I, I literally don't care. It's fine. You know. I mean, it is worse than just not watching to like do something that makes it clear that you didn't watch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like cringy, right? I'm just going to start commenting on all your videos. I'm just going to be like, I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> You're an idiot. Yeah, with his book haul. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually not true. <laughs> what? I don't believe you bought these books. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe I'll put out something for Fireblock because I, I really did. I just had a blast at this book. I think this is my most fun read of the year so far. Um, I mean, I low key. OK, you, you asked before if I think it's better than the main series. And like, I don't it's really hard to answer because like this was a re- the re- the main yeah. series was a reread. So like it was just like either confirming my old opinions or having some new takes. But it was it's a different thing from reading for the first time. And like, I definitely like this better than Duncan Egg. Duncan Egg was fine. But like Fire and Blood, I'm just so impressed. And like, I don't know if like I would be just as impressed with with the main series if that was my first time through and I wasn't already like, oh, I know what this is going to. You know, it's kind of like, um, who was I talking to about this? I don't know. But about how like if you read Peter Pan today, you read it and you're like, it feels derivative and cliche. But then you're like J.M. Mary in a world that had never heard of Neverland, had never mm-hmm. heard of Peter Pan, had never heard of Pixie Dust invented this stuff like completely out of his his brain and it's like so inventive if you like try to take your brain to a place where this didn't exist before that's why i felt like like, yeah 
And so like reading A Song of Ice and Fire, like I had read it before, I had seen the show before and now I was rereading it. So like, yeah. I don't know how impressed I would feel about it now. I can't know that. And I do know that I'm super impressed with Fire and Blood. So like it feels better to me because like I, it's a surprise. It's bias. Yeah. Yeah. So like right now, like my emotional answer is like, it's my favorite thing that he's written. But like, I don't know that that's actually true of what I think, but it feels true right now. <laughs> no, you know, that's that's fair. That's fair. I, I see what you're saying. It's definitely not mine, but I, I see what you're saying. And, and it is a different flex. I mean, it's it's a totally different thing. Oh, yeah. Because, um, you know, I mean, he's written. Impressive. Yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, not many other authors have done this type of thing. Or um, if they've tr if they've done it, like they have failed, you know, like it's just like to do yeah. it so authentically. It's like secret history uh, from Sanders. I don't know if it's exactly like this, but I think uh, for a lot of people. No. I was like John Atard. <laughs> oh, so, no. <laughs> It's not the, the secret, not. Okay. Mistborn secret history is literally just him doing like a Prometheus. It's oh. like it's narrative and you follow characters and it's just explaining. It's it's almost like a companion novel to Mistborn in a way, yeah. but it's explaining things that you didn't have explained in the main books, but it is it's 100 percent just a narrative book. It's not like, OK. It's not the history of like Elidil or uh, Luthadel or like it's not it, it's none of like this is how Alamancy was created. Like it's right. nothing like that. Well, and I mean, like, um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to bring up first law. Of course but like are. when I was like, would you ever consider writing something in a different era of your own world, giving us a prequel or like many actually like when I asked him this, in my brain, I wasn't even thinking of Song of Ice and Fire, even though I should have because he's a big fan. But I was thinking like Michael J. Sullivan when he wrote the Age of Age of Legends or Age of Empire or whatever it's called. But like it's like a thousand years before the Ryuria revelations, which is like the part that Jashan really likes. So it's like it's basically it's not even a prequel. Like there's like there's going to be something of legend in the main series that's familiar. But like it's not the prequel in the way that like Star Wars is where it's like literally these people's like parents. Um but anyway, point being, I was like, would you ever write anything that takes place like in a different era of your world, a prequel or, or something like, like that? Completely and he, separate. Yeah. Or like I was like a prequel or maybe like a different era or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, and he was like, well, no, because why? Because if you are wondering something, isn't it better to wonder? Like an would answering the question ever be better? Like probably. Yeah. Not. And yeah. so like for the mo for ninety nine point nine percent of the time, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Unless you can do fire and blood. And unless you have the inclination to do something as authentically, thoroughly historical as this is, like, you will fail and it will be stupid and dumb and pointless. And it'll be like, oh, it's a, that is a cash grab <laughs> is to do a prequel because yeah. it's the same IP and these mm. are familiar names. But like this, if you can do this, then yes. <laughs> yeah, it's an impressive feat. I mean, it's a risk, right? Um, and then even whenever you do it right, people will t still uh, say it's a cash grab. <laughs> Which is well, I, I think the they'd world. say it less if he had finished the main series before doing this. They probably still would have been like, "Oh, he just wants to like milk that now that he's." Oh yeah, there's the still, there, there would still be people. But out there. Yeah, people would be less angry about it because they'd like, well, they finished the series, so like, oh, more is always better. Well, it's a very jaded worldview. Like, I don't think anyone ever said that of Tolkien whenever he did Cimmerillion, right? Like, no one. But then again, his series is finished. Technically, it was finished, but. Well, and I think. Um, most 99.999% of the time, a prequel will be another novel. And that's when mm -hmm. it is like, well, this isn't interesting because like, you know, the end point or it's answering, giving answers that just make the main thing less interesting because like it was better when you yeah. didn't know. Um, but I think making this like a historical text, ever. but like because it reads like a historical text rather mm -hmm. than a novel, that's part of why it works. Because if he had written some novels about the Targaryens, like... You could, because there's plenty of material here to, for yeah. no novelization. But, like, that's also why it works, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of bad examples of when it doesn't work, like Fantastic Beast movies that have to directly tie into the Harry Potter trilogy. Like, that's also yeah. because J.K. Like, Rowling is not a very good writer. But there's that, but or it's like <laughs> the, the Hunger Games prequel with Snow. It's like, mm. did you need that? <laughs> or, like, did you need, did you need to do whatever the Twilight one was, where it's like whatever it was called from edward's perspective it's like did you need to do that no Probably like you not. just want to cash Needed in on the name money <laughs> mm -hmm. like it's I don't know. or the star wars 
millions of not even like the prequels like solo doing an obi-wan show doing a boba fett show it's like all of these things like doing rogue one like all of these things that have to tie directly into the main movies it's like just do something else it's fine just do yeah, a i mean well story. that's where i also feel like uh if an author i've said this more about retellings um but just goes for this as well like if the author already has something in mind and feels mm-hmm. called to tell a story yeah. that is about the and it and if that new story does Instead of just answering questions and making things less interesting or answering questions and making things dumb, if instead it sheds interesting new light on things in a way that like makes you want to reread the main series because you're like, oh, wow, that actually like completely alters my perspective on everything that happened thereafter and isn't just like, oh, that's a dumb answer. Like how Han Solo got the name Solo needed that answer. Now I must go and watch all of Star Wars again. (laughs) Not that. It's like, I I doubt... So to because I, I don't care about Star Wars, but it's like no one watching the original Star Wars movies was just like, I, I got to know where Han got his vest. Like, I need to know. Like, or no his one dice. Seen, we got to know where he got the dice. Like, no one cared. That's not something that needs to be explained. Do you need and to the, explain why Chewbacca has the nickname Chewy? Because apparently no, you do. <laughs> don't need that. That's dumb. I couldn't intuit stuff. that on my own. Like, I think That's I know not. how that came about. <laughs> Uh, to to Hunter's point about like the cynical view of like it's a template for a TV adaptation. If people think that, the reason I would disagree is because there's not a lot of dialogue, so like scenes would have to be written with compelling dialogue to actually like. I mean, the, the show is kind of the novelization of the is, history text, but like mm-hmm. part of it, right? But so I mean, yeah. a lot of the conversations are going to be completely on the writers to create that, and it could suck. Yeah, that's the biggest challenge going forward. I think the premise, super interesting. Um, yeah. The outcome, awesome. We have an ending, hey. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that the people who are doing the direction and the production and the score and all these things are going to be great. Actors seem really, really solid. It's literally going to come down to the writing. The like script, 100%. yeah. Yeah, it's Which is why about- I said it can never. It's never going to be worse than season eight. It'll be at least on par with season eight. Because yeah. everything other than the writing we know is in place. Yeah. 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 It, and, and, you know, they're, they're going to have to flesh out the characters a little bit, too. Um, like, we know the characters. We know what they did. But, like, who are they? And, mm-hmm. like, that'll be interesting to see if, like, you know, da- Dame, does Damon come across totally different on, on the screen than he did the page? Because Damon seemed like a kind of a psychopath to me. Um, I don't know. That'll be that'll be really fun to see. We'll also get answers about, um, you know, even blood and cheese. Maybe we'll see Rhaenyra give the orders, like, uh, for Jaharis to be the one executed. Like, we actually are going to get some answers if you want to take it as canon, which is really fascinating, uh, which will also get answers for like the tourney of Heron Hall when George does his uh, Broadway play that's supposed to come out like two years or whatever the hell. But like, will we see or do we want to see or does George care about before the Targaryens? Because like that's quite relatively recent history that Targaryens took over. Well, yeah, so he he definitely has an interest in that, and that was the long night uh, thing that they tried to film, and they end up canceling it after the pilot. The pilot apparently just did not go well. They didn't like it. They can't. They they canned it. But the long night was about the first time the White Walkers came through, which would have been honestly pretty sick. Uh, yeah, but that's still, I mean, forest, like I mean, all of this. I mean, they were like a uh, you know feuding lord. You know, it was more like well, like Vikings when you have like mm-hmm. little earldoms that are basically fighting each other until the Darkarians came in and were like, everybody is us now. <laughs> so yeah. like there would be a lot of interesting politicking and fighting and whatever. And the Children of the Forest would add a really interesting piece to the story, I think. Or um, like the beginning of the Night's Watch. Who built that freaking wall? <laughs> Brand the Builder. Okay, I mean. I guess, but like you, like having somebody be like, you know what we need is a giant, giant wall. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the show that I think could do really well outside of House of the Dragon is the Dunkin' Egg show. I think uh, episodic kind of like that honestly, is still after Targaryen. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was just thinking in my head, just like thinking about shows. And I'm like, man, Dunkin' Egg would work. I Maybe too close to the Mandalorian in some well, regards during but... the Targaryens. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it, after the conquest of the Targaryen. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, I want a conquest movie. I don't care. Which is interesting that like George R. R. Martin basically takes the like AC, uh, like BC and AD mm-hmm. that we have and applies that to the Targaryens. Yeah, before conquest, after conquest. Yep, pretty cool. <laughs> so, 
silence. I think I think we've done it. I think we've covered fire and blood. Just savoring. <laughs> covered fire and blood. Yeah, not really, but I mean we didn't. <laughs> well, well at least an hour <laughs> as of much as we're going to. Content. There's um, entirely too much to like actually dig into everything. Yeah, out of all well, you books... literally have to do like a read a chapter it would have to be like a, a week and then like yeah, talk you could do about a podcast. And that's whenever we were talking about it, and I would say, well, we could break it up in parts, but honestly, I think uh, I think we we hit on the points that we really enjoyed, what we found to be strengths of it, and I think that's what people wanted. Um, this is the book that I'd probably say is the one I'm most interested in rereading currently because yeah. there's so. I mean, I'm not going to do it right now, but you know, this is the one that I definitely don't know the most about, so I can pick up new things on a reread for sure. Mm-hmm. There's also just Absolutely. like you're much more likely to have missed something because if you oh, miss yeah. a sentence, you've missed 10 years of Without history. A doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> well, that's why somebody somebody in my Discord was just like, uh, he said, I'm impressed that you managed to get through all of the book in a week. There's so much information in there. And I was like, yeah, I, I didn't retain all of it, though. Like, there's nah. no way I know everything that happened in this book. I forget about Trust books me. that I read two weeks ago. So do I. It sucks. But that's why it does also feel like reading a history book, which is why like I would often feel stressed about like actually passing a test because I'd be like, oh, I mean, no. as I was reading it, I was getting it. But if you expecting me to remember the name and the date, which is what this multiple choice question will be. I would. Feel. <laughs> it would. It would. Just go watch Rain of Fire. Are they definitely going to do Dunkin' Egg? Uh, yeah, they order. They order the pilot. So for what least, HBO? Yeah, for HBO. So we'll see what happens. And it, it would be a it would be a cool show. Yeah. I would definitely want it. would it. be a night's tale. Yeah, I think Absolutely. I think that it could do a lot with it. Um, an episodic night's tale. It'd be say. a lot of fun. You know, since Robert Baratheon is in a night's tale. I was it. about to say that, but then I was like, <laughs> I've already said that before. <laughs> so good. So yeah, when I first saw uh, Game of Thrones, I was like that's Roland from a night seal <laughs> as king. <laughs> he finally made it. I mean, he like passed up the night and shot straight for king. <laughs> uh, I actually used to love that movie, so I'm both making fun of it, but also, yes, I kind of loved it because it's still like one of the best dragon movies that's ever existed because most movies that have dragons in them are just dog shit i was gonna mention this it's earlier true. like when we were talking about hobbs dragons and like hobbs dragons remind me of um the dragon and dragon heart yeah now reign of fire if you have not seen it is christian bale that's like learning about dragons a little bit and you have matthew mcconaughey who's got like a gnarly beard he's got a bald head he's like a marine like dragon hunter he wears like a dragon tooth necklace <laughs> just like i'm just picturing it's... like have you you've seen tropic thunder yes the guy that supposedly wrote the roy story that they're basing his this movie off of like that's mm-hmm. what I'm picturing. yeah no that's that's matthew mcgonaghy in reign of in uh reign of fire it's fantastic <laughs> and they fight dragons and it's cool but yeah, I mean, as much as I was saying, like, there's a most of the time books, I'm like, ooh, dragons. And then 90% of the time, like, I hate it. Same with movies. Like, most of the time, I'm like, ooh, dragon. But most movies get it wrong. And I'm like, no, I hate this. This is stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, as bad as the Hobbit movies are, it did give us Benedict Cumberbatch's smog, which is, like, pretty I mean, great. they're still fine. Smog. They're fine. Oh, anyway, wait, we have Sherlock and Watson as Smog and Bilbo. Which if is if they weren't kind of Tolkien excellent. films, they would be great fantasy film. I don't know. Not not good. the third one. The first one is pretty good. I don't know. I had a good time. I mean, I they're nowhere near the original. They're fine. Movie. The but, third yeah, one? The I third one has watching. Legolas jumping on ice that is falling, and he's <laughs> jumping on it as it's, it's falling. Movie. Yeah, it was fine. If you're a kid, you'd be loving it. Yeah, was I, I was a child when I saw the two towers. I thought it was awesome that Legolas slid down an orc that shield. That is awesome. So down a set of stairs. And that is way better stairs. than the jumping on rocks. It's total falling. shenanigans. Or, you know, climbing up onto an elephant and then sliding down that its trunk awesome. and being like, huh. Like, it's all okay, nonsense. But, but the awesome. difference is, I was in the theater seeing Return of the King. And when Legolas single-handedly owned that Oliphant, mm-hmm. the audience of adults Cheered. erupted into applause. Yeah. I was in the theater when I saw Legolas jumping on rocks as they're falling and everyone groaned. So 
Not same. <laughs> it's a very pessimistic crowd. Well, also, we happens we when you shoehorn in a popular character into a movie that he had nothing to do with. But anyway, well, yeah. also the fact that the Battle of Five Armies is like two pages of the Hobbit, but that's an entire three-hour movie. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, he has the best dragon voice. Do we want to wrap up with anything? Not any wisdom to share, Jimmy, or the expert? Cliffhanger of if we're going to do a world of ice and fire or not. Or a different uh, empire of the vampire. <laughs> you just um, straight up said it. She, she, she just she said it. She, she, she let the cat out the bag. I mean. That's out of the bag now. I think the cat's been out of the bag. Yeah. Um, I everyone forgot. I mean, this has been a lot of fun. This is, I mean, we could probably do the World of Ice and Fire, but um, I don't know when. <laughs> I don't know when I can it's up do to it. you, Jimmy. Um, this was great. This is a lot of fun. Um, I want to do it again soon. So as soon as we get Winds of Winter, we have to do this all over again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at that point. I, I think we will. Here, so channel. we can agree to that, is that if and when Winds gets a release date, we'll do this again. And we'll go back through the books again. I'm down. I'm down. I'm definitely down. Do we have to like sign in blood somewhere? Or... Yes. I'll tell you what, this is a good. Leanna, do we get the well, wins a winner? Yes or no? Do we get it ever? Yes. 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 Okay. You, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> we I've will all... get wins. If we you will... are going to ask about dreams of spring, less, I'm we less We will sure. not get a dream of spring. We but... might get another Duncan egg. We will not get fire and blood part two. No, I agree. I agree with all that. I I uh, I think by really? November 2025 we'll have wins a winner. That's my prediction. You said end of 2025? November 2025. Look at the next comment. This is just Leanna's favorite thing in the world. So let's do first law next. I mean that would be a lot of fun. That is my next reread. Uh, Leanna, scene. have you read first law though? <laughs> Did you just say you're rereading it, Jimmy? Because like next year, in- yeah. I, uh, I I will join you if you will let me. Yeah, I was hoping to do it this year, but there's literally no way it's going to happen. So Hold next on. year. Leanne, are you saying you were going to reread for us all again? I mean, you talked me into it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really strike me as a rereading kind of person. No, not at all, right? Yeah, not unless it's Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Joe Abercrombie's trilogies and entire saga are arguably finished, at least finished enough. Hunter said, uh, guys, this series of Song of Ice Fire live chats was great. I usually don't watch stuff like this. Well, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. We glad wanted to, did. yeah, we wanted to do it because, like, we still, like, love the books. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, stuff that's polarizing around the series. But at the end of the day, I think what's published is uh, really great and still some of the best fantasy and, and fiction that, that, that we have. So, um, And also, after the show, like, it was really good to go back and be like, okay, but what was actually in the books? Because, like, my yeah. brain is very muddied with Especially books four and five. I mean, especially books four and five. Um, And the fact that we had some people doing their first rereads with us, or Mm -hmm. first reads, I should say. um, That's awesome. That's awesome. I think it stuck out to me immediately when I started reading A Game of Thrones, and I was just like, there is way more in this book one. Yeah. I remember being in it that I thought was like, because it was stuff that happened like later in the show. I was like, that happened in A Game of Thrones? What? It's pretty crazy. Yeah. I uh, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on book tube. I wouldn't be reading all these books that I've read. Um, if if not for Song of Ice and Fire, so I'm personally indebted to uh, George. And we wouldn't have First Law without Song of Ice and Fire. That is true. So I'm personally indebted to George. <laughs> oh, there's Tyrion. some fanfic for you right there, Tyrion. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah, I think it's. Mm. I don't know. That's that's a hard one. It depends on if they're drunk. <laughs> yeah, honestly, the winds of winter will tell us a lot because Tyrion won't have all of his money and his status. He's working his way back up. So yeah, a lot of his wit that, is based on I have right. money. <laughs> yeah. It was the friends we met along the way. <laughs> Yeah, I think the Valencar prophecy will probably be uh, Tyrion. By the way, why not Jamie? 
I think it's going to be Tyrion. I hope it's Jamie. Tyrion fantasy. I thought I had convinced you that it was Jamie in a previous live show, Jamie. So I need you to go back and watch that and be reconvinced. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's totally impossible. I just think that the way that Tyrion has constant dragon dreams and talks about fantasizing about burning his family and burning, like burning Castle Rock. I think Cersei gets displaced in the winds of winter from West Rose heads back to Castle Rock. Tyrion shows up with Danny. He burns Castle Rock. It's an atrocity. I think, I think that's probably what it's happens. better if it's Jamie. I, and, see I don't remember why I, what my argument was, but I remember you being impressed by it. So I, I want you to be impressed it's, by me. It's ultimately because it would be like the final, like complete opposite end of the spectrum for Jamie to end up being the one that kills Cersei because she's so out of control that he has to. And he out has to love. kind of like fall on his sword one last time and, and take her out and not get toppled by bricks because that was just dumb. <laughs> Because um, she's hateful and I'm hateful. But I what think it would said. work better thematically if it was Jamie. Tyrion feels a little bit too like obvious. I, I don't even want to say obvious, but like he already killed Tywin. And like if he's also gonna kill Cersei, I, I just I would love it for Jamie's character arc to have to be the one to take her down. Well, well I make also the, think make the Kingslayer a Kinslayer. I also think that Tyrion kills Jamie. But that's a, that's a whole nother can of worms. I don't see that. I don't either. No, remember in the in the books when they split. I mean, they. I know he's kind of a dick. He's it's he's rough. way more. He's way more jerky jerkison in the books than he's in the show. <laughs> but it took a lot for him to kill Tywin. I don't. And yeah. overall, like yeah. over the course of a lifetime, Jamie has been pretty good to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's pretty mad about that. But of course, what was all building towards is that Taisha is a secret Targaryen. And... Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fair enough. Confirmed. Jamie could use a rope or something. That's the real reason that Tywin didn't want her him to be with Taisha, because like Targaryens, you know, brother and sister, like because Tyrion, we know, is a secret Targaryen. And if Taisha is also a secret Targaryen, and Tywin is like, none of this incest. Absolutely not. So that's why he put a stop to that. Confirmed. Mm -hmm. Confirmed. Heard it here. Also, yes, Stephen Pacey is everything. All right. And yes, he has one hand. He can't strangle her. Random shit. <laughs> so that, was right. and blood. that was fire and blood. <laughs> that was fire and blood. And it was awesome. It was awesome. And I'm really glad to have done this with you guys. This has been really fun. Yes, thank you guys for doing this. This was uh, one of the highlights of my of my past year on BookTube, I would say. And I even got to meet Jim R. R. Martin, which you know. <laughs> yeah, that was goaded. The one time <laughs> it was terrific. And I got through so much of my Song of Ice and Fire whiskey; it's like not even funny. Yeah, yeah, the many drinks were had. <laughs> I've had those bottles for so long, and now they're all empty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks all, and. We will reconvene when uh, when Jimmy's ready. <laughs> <laughs> when when's a winner happens? When George is ready. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Bye, everybody.